forward in uh, uh, in the go in a direction parallel to the iris. And as you can see here, the rexus is already done. But if, if, if your main tunnel is, uh, is done before the rexus, then you, have the, you, you can jeopardize opening the procedure capsule if you're still pointing backwards. Basically, your one, this is how you want your one to look like. This is the, 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 the entrance at the beginning is a vertical entrance, and then you go lamellar, and then you go dipping, and once you dip inside and you're inside the interior chamber, you go parallel to the plane of the iris. And eventually, this is how your wound should look like. Again, another video for the main tunnel with uh, a, 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 like a bad type of, uh, uh, of a keratome. It, it has, it gives, it's giving us a resistance so I can fix the globe from here and then make sure that I, I go in. Only the shoulders pass, the widest part passes, and then I don't need, once this, the widest part has passed, I don't need to go further forward. Once the widest part of the keratome has passed, the inner side of my wound, I don't need to go further. Having had the Rex's pre-made before the, the main tunnel gives me a chance to uh, secure myself and, uh, and makes me very confident that I will not do any injury to the anterior capsule. Another time, main tunnel, slowly. Your, your surgical openings are critical, very critical, to perform a smooth surgery. Okay, here you can see I have a penis, okay? I choose to go a clear corneal incision, a clear corneal incision. Some people would prefer to, to go through the penis because if the penis is vascularized, it promotes healing faster. While for me, I prefer sealing after the surgery. I prefer to go sealing. It's much easier to hydrate and seal the clear cornea than to hydrate and seal a fibrosed penis. Now, after you have done your, uh, your, your, your side boards uh, as part of my surgery, I start doing the viscoelastic. You start introducing the viscoelastic. There's a very beneficial uh, uh, benefit from uh, putting a viscoelastic early is it maintains your AC. So now, to put your viscoelastic, you need to go to the other side of the surgical incision that you've done, and then inject while withdrawing backwards. As you can see, let's see this again. You go inside, start injecting as you pass to the other side, and then when you're here, you inject and then withdraw. Inject copiously and withdraw. And you can see the line going backwards. All the fluid now is coming out of the uh, uh, surgical incision, and the AC is fully filled with uh, 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 elastic. If you start injecting viscoelastic from this side and then you move forward, you can entrap fluid here and that will compromise your uh, uh, anterior chamber once you start doing uh, uh, surgical maneuvers inside. This is another movie. Uh, okay, this is another movie for 
the introduction of elastic. As you can see, I am injecting as I'm moving there, and then I start injecting copiously. The, the injection at the beginning is just to maintain a track for myself so that the AC does not collapse. And as you can see, I'm injecting my uh, viscoelastic from the side board. And I will show you why I'm doing this, because with here, I'm, if I'm giving the, 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 the basic course, I'm always trying to give you the, the safest uh, mode of doing uh, surgery and the, the steps that gives you reproducible result. Now I'm going to start discussing something critical before I start discussing the erections, uh, which is handling your instrument inside the eye. If you have an instrument inside the eye and you want to move this instrument from point A to point B, so let's say I have a cystome or, uh, uh, for example, I have a cystome and I want to move my, my cystome from point A to point B. If I move my instrument to point B and I move the whole instrument to this side, this will re result in the first rotation of the globe, second movement of the globe towards this direction, and then also corrugations at the level of the cornea that will hinder your visualization. So what is the best way to do this? The best way is to move the back of your instrument in the opposite direction. You move the back of your instrument to the opposite direction, that will give you a movement of the tip towards point B without moving the hinge or the entrance. Uh, and that will give you stable flow, well visualization and without uh, uh, corrugations in the cornea, so you can see your, your, the inside of the eye uh, clearly. You, you don't have any uh, problems uh, with eye movement. As you can see in, in this drawing, it, it tells you what happens. If you pull your instrument up, you get corrugations in the cornea. If you pull uh, the, the, the chopper uh, up, it will cause corrugations in the cornea. If you push the whole instrument from point A to B, you're pushing, you get corrugations on this side and the, mo and the eye moves. If you move the way we said, you move the tip to A to B, but the back of the instrument moves on the opposite direction, that will give you a smooth movement and steady globe with visualization without hindering by corrugations or uh, spray. Now we go to the Rexus part. First, you have to uh, realize the difference between uh, creating a tear by shearing or by ripping. Shearing uh, gives you, um, uh, if, if you use the ripping, you get more resistance from uh, tissue parts or tissue bonds. If you use the shearing, you get the lesser resistance. And in this part, I will uh, open my camera and then I will, uh, I will try to uh, show you how um, this could uh, look like. Okay, so... If, if, um, okay. Sorry. Okay. So now, my, in my, this paper, this piece of paper in front of me, if I have a tear, a small tear in it, and I want to extend this tear from this point to a small point under it, okay? If I use tearing, which is I'm going to hold from here, and from here, and then pull them apart. I'm going to pull them apart. Like in the, draw, in the drawing in front of here, the lower part, the lower drawing here, lower half of the screen. If I start pulling to the, part, to the sides, I'm going to start slowly, gently pulling to the sides, and then suddenly I get a tear. See how the tear extends a very long distance. Now, I don't want that. What happened is I had resistance from several points, now look at the, at the drawing in front of you. I have resistance from point A and point B and point C. The point A gives me the most resistance, but B is aiding in the resistance, C is aiding, and B also is aiding. So once I reach enough power to break A, I break B and C and D quickly, and everything breaks away. So I get a, a very long tear like I did here. But Let's try something else. If I get another piece of paper and I start my scratch, but now 
I'm going to bend my flap forward. I'm, I'm bending it forward, creating a flap like in the upper half of the screen here. It's my drawing. And then I'm going to start pulling it down. You see, I'm creating a tear with the least amount of effort. The least amount of effort. Because now, when I, when I put my flap down here, now I'm tackling point A alone, point B alone, point C alone. I am tackling every point of bond between the tissues separately. So I am using the least power. I am using the least power to, to create my tear. And less power means more control. Less power means more control. So back again to uh, without my camera. So shearing is the best method to create uh, uh, a tear in the capsule, in the in the in the in the capsule, because it, you are using the least power, you have the highest control. When you have the highest control, you 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 can control your axis, extend it left, right, take it wherever you want. How do you prefer to do your rexes? I, I would like to ask people about this. If you prefer to do your rexes with a cystitome or with a forceps? If you prefer a cystitome, please press yes on the side and then you start taking your flap you press on the anterior flap on the anterior on the, on the uh, uh, anterior capsule and you drag it and this edge is the edge of the flap this is the lens matter this is the edge of the flap it tells you where the rexis is going to be this is where it's going to move so when you pull it in an arc direction you start pulling it in an arc direction it starts giving you uh, uh, the, the circular, and this, is, this is this line tells you where the the, the rest of the rexis is going. As long as you're taking this line to that this way, it's going to follow you. This is going to follow you anywhere. Okay. A critical point is when you press from a far distance like this, you ensure to yourself that you're not pressing too hard here, and you're dragging the lower part of the flap. If you're if you're dragging the anterior capsule itself, not the uh, flap. Like if you press too hard in point Z, if you press too hard, then you're not only dragging the flap, you're dragging the capsule under it. And if you're dragging the capsule, then you're not doing the shearing movement. You are actually doing a tearing movement. And I will demonstrate this uh, in a surgical step in a minute. In the ripping, it's a totally different uh, uh, strategy. Because now you're not using uh, the, the you're not using the, 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 the shearing to this direction. You're going to be dragging centrally. You're going to be dragging centrally and waiting for that equivalent force to take you to a uh, arc, like uh, exactly like in this drawing. You drag to the center. You drag to the center. You hold from here and you drag to the center, and then the rexus follows in an arc. And as you can see. You can combine both techniques sometimes. When you're doing your shearing, sometimes if the rexus extends, for she for, to, to use shearing alone to uh, retrieve the rexus here, it's going, to, it's going to work, but it's going to take a long distance. And if you're going, it's going to, it's going to go in a circular way, and it's a long distance. And if you're already near to the zenules of the equator, that could be an extension backwards. So what you need to do is do the ripping. You do the ripping, as we demonstrated uh, on, on the piece of paper I've used right now, you, 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 you pull centrally and then it, it 
retrieves back. You pull center and it retrieves back. As, as you can see, this, I regained shearing again after I pulled centrally, and then this curve came back to me. Now, there's another way which, uh, with the ripping, um, I want to illustrate it to you. Let me open my camera again. Now, if I do my shearing and it extends from me, so it's it's extending. Oh, I'm still doing the virtual uh, thing. Sorry. Okay, now you can see me. So, if I'm doing this, if, if this is an extended rex, and I want to retrieve this rex backward, what I do is this is this is my my flap, and it's going down there, and then it extended this way. Oh, it's extended. Okay, so I want to retrieve it. So either you use the ripping and you go this way and it comes back to me, okay? Or I can use a different method if the extension is too far. I've extended too far, too far, and now I need it back. I need it really back now, not uh, after a minute or so. So it's extending and I want it back. What I would do is my flap, I take it backward to its original side. And then I pull it in the opposite direction. I pull it in the opposite direction. And when I pull, I don't want to uh, demonstrate it. Uh, I'm doing my shearing, okay? And then it trips. It uh, extends, and I want it back. If I pull, I, I take my flat back to its original place, and I, took, I pull in the extreme opposite direction, there is absolutely no way to go except vertical on the point of the vision. Vertical. So, to look at my drawing, if I'm here, I will take this flap backwards here, backwards here to its original place, and I will pull in this direction. If I pull in this direction, this will come back this way. Vertical to this line, it will come back this way. Exactly like. You see my paper? It came back exactly vertical. It came back vertical. Okay? Because there's no other direction it can go back from. Right? So this is the, the three methods to uh, uh, put in mind, or the three uh, mechanics that we put in mind while doing our rexes. Now, I'm going to show you a rexes that is demonstrated on our uh, simulator machine, which is the supposed to be the optimal way to do a rexus with a shearing. You fill your viscoelastic, as we uh, uh, said. You go to the other side, you fill it, and you, then you withdraw backwards as all the fluid is leaving the anterior chamber. And now the anterior chamber is fully filled with our uh, viscoelastic. And now you take your scratch, you pull it towards you, and you create your flap. At this point, you can use your cystitone or you can change to your rexes. And rexes can give you a good control. And then you start taking your flap and constantly putting it above the anterior capsule. Constantly leaving it above the anterior capsule. So now you're doing a shearing movement. You're taking the flap and moving it, and you have a mark on the anterior capsule on our simulator, it gives you a mark so you can follow. And you are moving the anterior capsule directly on top of the flap. Your flap is moving directly in on top of the anterior capsule. So you make sure that it's constantly, and now you do a ripping movement and you're done. Okay? So I'm gonna demonstrate a, 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 a Rexes, my Rexes, how I do my Rexes. I do my Rexes from the sideboard. This Rexes gives me, like, I've been using this technique for uh, more than 10 to 12 years now, and this Rexes technique gives me a reproducible result, result every time. Every case you're going to do, you're going to have exactly the same uh, uh, result. So what I do is I open my sideboards, fill with the uh, risk elastic, and then I create my flap centrally, and then I pull it. As you can see, I'm pulling my flap here, 
create the flap, and now the flap is lying on top of the interior capsule. As you can see here, this is the rexus and this is the edge of the flap. I hope this is uh, visible for you. And as you move slowly, every time you move, the edge of the flap is telling you where the rexus is going to be. The edge of the flap is following, uh, is leading the, uh, the rexus. Very gently, very slowly, and very surely. And this will give you a rounded rexus with a reproducible result that will happen every time you do it. Now, if I want to show you on, on this case again, this is another case. I do my scratch, push it, create my flap, and now the flap is lying, and you can see the edge of the flap and the rex is followed. The edge of the flap and the rex, and I keep a distance away from the, uh, the fold itself. The angle of the fold, I keep a distance from it. So now, I, even if I press on the anterior capsule, my pressure is, is, is ineffective or are not, uh, not affecting the edge of the rexus that's moving. And now I have a rounded rexus, the reproducible result that will look exactly the same with every case. Let's see this, this one.
sorry, a very deep anterior, anterior chamber. Pressure in the anterior chamber is maintained. I'm coming in from the side port, no leaking, nothing comes out. This is and of my uh, rexus, and it's a reproducible circular uh, rexus as well. Now, to show the tearing technique, this is how it looks like. You, you do a box movement. So the first movement is left and then down, and then you take the down and go right, and then you take the right and go up, and that's the end of your rex. You have a, a rexus by now. This is a very efficient technique, okay? And it's, it's, uh, it's reproducible also, but it needs training. For a starting uh, surgeon, I, I really would want you to uh, do the shearing. The, the tearing technique is a quick way to do a rexus, and all the quick surgeons, the surgeons that perform uh, uh, past surgeries, they use the, uh, the, the ripping or the tearing technique. But it's, it's, uh, it, it, if, if it has a more chances of uh, uh, tearing away and extending out of the uh, of your way. So it's a, it's, you do a box movement. One movement gives you an arc. The other movement gives you Go on with your exercise, and as you will see, it's a box move. Grab your flap, and then you're going to go this way, and then up, and then left. Make sure that the, you, you're, you, sorry, it's too short. Let's do that again. See with the Rexus force, so I'll show you the Rexus force move. So you go, you go left, uh, right, sorry, and then down, and then big grasp and go left, and then up, and your rex is full. Okay. Now I will show you combining the two techniques of sharing and tearing. The one that I just described uh, uh, a, few, a few slides ago. When you start your rexus, and your rexus is small, and you want to do a tear in it to extend it a little bit. So look at the edge of the rexus here. So my flap is co comes here, and I'm dragging my flap, as you can see here. And now it's too narrow. So I'm going to go to the edge, as I said, and pull. And you see the notch that I did here? Now it's bigger. You see the notch here? Yeah. Now my rexus is wider. I don't like it still. I want it in it. So I do it another time and I make another notch and then I start pulling from the other side, doing my normal.
I'm going to show you a case of Argentinian flag tear. So in this case, you start the rexus, and the tension inside the capsule is very high. And once I go in, I inject, and 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 you can see it's extend, it's extending, and that's it. I didn't even get the chance to aspirate anything from inside the, the lens, and it it just extended. Uh, in another case, uh, I I've, I've taken it, make it the rounded edges, and then I, I continue my surgery. In this case, uh, as you can see, we didn't open the the ports in the back. We had a very full anterior chamber, but still, once the anterior, well, that's it. That's it. It was bam. You have uh, Argentinian tear uh, with no uh, no compromise for it. But of course, because I was intending to do vitrectomy at the time, so it was it wasn't a big deal. Just made two round uh, rounded edges, and then I performed my uh, my uh, my phaco because uh, what's the worst that could happen? I am already in the back. Um, hydro dissection. I'm going to do uh, the part of the hydro dissection. I'm sorry about the videos of the of the rexes, but uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah, I demonstrated enough. Okay. Um, in the hydro dissection, hydro dissection and hydro deviation are critical parts of your surgery because they affect your load, which is the the amount of uh, of pressure you are using on uh, your uh, you. So in hydro section, you go under the anterior capsule, and then you inject, and you watch for a wave of fluid to pass by to the other side, and you can see the wave of fluid, and then you check the hydro section by rotation, and then you dip yourself inside and inject to do hydro delineation, and then you you can see the golden ring. And you pull to one side and see the uh, uh, this shadow arcs here, and then you have the the, the hydro delineation check post. Let's see this in a surgery now. I finished my rexes. I go inside. I press, and I can see the wave. Did you see the wave is moving again? I go under the cup tool and I inject it even start under the capsule, and then I do my rotation. Now I have the hydro section is full. I do my hydro delineation. You see the golden ring, push it to the sides, and then you have a full golden ring, and you have hydro section and hydro delineation. Hydro section sets the, the the lens capsule, uh, the lens uh, matter from the lens capsule. Hydro section sets the lens matter from the lens capsule. Hydro delineation takes your uh, epinucleus from uh, and, and cortex from the nucleus. So when you're dividing your nucleus and taking out uh, quadrants, the load you are using and the power the, the, the power of vacuum that you need to take out a piece makes it uh, 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 much easier and small uh, and uh, less uh, energy needed. One more time, how do section and how do delineation? It's a critical part of your surgery also because it makes everything easy. You can rotate your lenses and you can see the wave a move. And then I will go now and make sure it's complete. I check it by the rotation. Now it's rocked and rotated. I will do the hydro delineation now. Okay, now it's rotated. I will go inside and I will do the hydro delineation. You can see the, the golden ring. It's a, it's a bigger ring this time because it's a bigger nucleus. And then you have it. You have it. Ring, and we've completed our delineation, and you can see the golden ring, but it's a bigger golden ring. You've completed the delineation and the hydrogen section. I'm not going to get a chance to talk about the FACO techniques this time, but uh, in the next session, I will be uh, discussing the dividing conquer, the chop, whether horizontal or vertical, and the variations of both and using both of them. Uh, in our next uh, lecture. Um, I think I can take some questions now. Anything uh, concerning uh, what I uh, just uh, demonstrated? Anybody has a question, they can raise their hand. And 
I can take some questions now. I have 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Dr. Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, and this one, uh, in case of Rex's uh, uh, extension, uh, you will you will uh, toward the center or uh, in the opposite direction of the extension. This is the first both, of both of them will work. You pull towards the center if the extension is not too far. If it's medium, like like it's a medium extension. I think I had a bit here, but I can't tell which one of them. Uh, for the extended, uh, I I think I have a video for the extended praxis here. Uh, if if the extension is too far, then you need to pull on the opposite direction. Like take your flap to the original position, as if you don't have a flap, and then you pull directly to the opposite side direction. If the extension is midway, and then you can use the center, and it will give you a curve a curved uh, retrieval but the, the one i'm showing you it will give you a, a like a vertical retrieval you will treat the, the mm. races mm. back, totally backwards yes yeah, yeah you should you should have a uh, space for uh, curved retrieval in of course uh, no, no, not so far extension. Yes, it is uh, understood. Okay. Second, uh, the, uh, second, uh, my second question: uh, What was the fault in the cases of Argentina flag sign? Uh, yeah. What was the fault? Well, no. What was the cause? I, I, yeah, the, Argentina. Okay. There is a lot of debate about why Argentinian tears happen. Usually, it's uh, in a cataract that is uh, mature and has a uh, lens matter that has uh, uh, extended and there is a, a high pressure inside the anterior, uh, inside the, the, the lens capsule. This pressure is, uh, is, is, is formed by lens matter behind the, uh, the, the, the nucleus and anterior to the, uh, to the nucleus. And usually there's one theory that says that if you have a very big nucleus, that separates the anterior and the posterior part of the of this uh, lens matter, and, uh, and 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 for you, you have to maintain a very high pressure of, of the anterior chamber to combat or or to equalize this pressure when you open the anterior capsule. But uh, there's no gentilin tear without uh, staining, so the stain also changes the texture of the uh, anterior capsule. So there's a lot of debate about this, and and you do precautions. You 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 do uh, uh, take measures like increasing the anterior chamber pressure. Like uh, if there's too much uh, uh, cortex matter, you try to press the, the 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 nucleus backwards and aspirate some of the cortex and increase the pressure again before you uh, pursue with your uh, uh, rexes. You make a smaller rexes and then you go spirally around it so it doesn't extend, but Sometimes you just, as you as you saw in the, in this uh, in this case, mm -hmm. absolutely nothing, nothing. We just uh, made a puncture, and that puncture extended uh, uh, in an Argentinian tear. You couldn't, and the pressure in the anterior chamber was very high. As you can see, the, the anterior chamber is very deep, so the pressure is very high, and then there was nothing to be done. Sometimes you cannot even you cannot uh, prevent it. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Uh, I'll take Dr. Ahmed Samir. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, why doing a hydro dissection. Uh, the lens of uh, tip of cannula, it go far away from the legs as the edge, or it is just beneath it? This is the first one. And second question, uh, why we are doing hydro dissection? It is necessary to press by the back of the hydrodissection cannula on the lip of the main incision or no? Uh, I don't think it's necessary that you be pressing on the on the in the lip here because your instrument is inside and it's creating enough space to, to for fluid to come out. The, the main point is what I do is I press on the lower lip of the wound to make sure that the capsular cap has left the anterior chamber. And that's a sign that you have removed most of the viscoelastic, okay, or, or a big portion of the viscoelastic inside the anterior capsule. So what you do is you press 
on the uh, uh, on the uh, uh, lower uh, lip of the of the wound, and that takes your viscoelastic out, and then you go inside. The distance that you travel after the rex is is like one millimeter. You don't need to go very far where you cannot see it, and you can't be like on the um, tip of the edge of the you go for one millimeter, and then you inject, and you don't inject forcefully. You don't inject forcefully. You you just need to make sure that your wave is moving smoothly, and that you don't create high pressure of fluid in the back, back of the uh, uh, nucleus or the lens. Uh, uh, because that could rupture your posterior capsule, and that's what we call capsular tension syndrome that can happen uh, intraoperatively. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll take Dr. Dildar. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. So, regarding the capsular access technique, sir, you don't mention the technique of the spiral capsular access that using the uh, rexus forceps and start concentrically from the center in a spiral matter, increasing your rexus uh, to you. I, I, just, I just mentioned it right now. I didn't get a video of it, but I just mentioned yeah. it right now as, as one of the techniques of preventing the, the, the Argentinian back there. Yeah, I, I think this is especially is important for the uh, beginners that uh, they learn to take uh, you mean You mean in all for the first time? Because they give, give them more control over rexus. Are you talking they give about, them more uh, control over the rexus. Okay, yeah. are you talking about using the spiral, spiral rexus for uh, uh, normal rexus yeah. or for the Argentinian pair? No, no, for every case, for beginners, and especially for those who are in terms of cataracts, to prevent this Argentinian uh, plaque. Okay. I would, I would definitely recommend to this. To, yeah. Okay, I would definitely recommend this for, uh, uh, for, the, for the, uh, the, the prevention of Argentinian plaque tear. But I would not recommend this for a beginner, because once you start the second circle, your anterior uh, capsule flap is uh, is going to be a very thin flap. It's like an like peeling an orange. The flap is going to be a very thin flap. And once mm -hmm. you start dealing with a thin flap, then you're you're you you're, you're going to be doing a, 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 like three rexuses. You're going to be doing the rexus three times. No, I would recommend. If you're a beginner, I would recommend to, to follow the technique I've just shown right now. It's a very uh, reproducible technique. Every time you do this technique, you will get exactly the same result. Use the shearing, use the, uh, uh, the, the, the side port with a cystitome or uh, micro excess forceps and try it. And you will uh, find that your hands anatomically are aligned more anatomically I will open uh, my camera again to show uh, my opinion about uh, my hands. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if, if you if you're trying to do your rexes from the uh, uh, twelve o'clock or the uh, two o'clock or the, the one o'clock, uh, eleven o'clock uh, positions, uh, your hand is like this. Okay, this is not an anatomical position for your hand, like comfortable anatomical position for your hand. But when you put your hand like this and you're going from the side port three or nine, this is a very anatomical comfortable, comfortable uh, position. And you can move, do the, because the shearing movement is a very fine movement. And you can, it's like you're, you're, you're moving as a, as a feather. So you can do it from the side ports. Try it and, and you will not regret it. It's a very good technique and it, it's reproducible and you can always get exactly the same results in every case. And my residents, if any of them is here, they've seen me do all my cases, and all my rexuses look identical and exactly the same. Okay, thank so, you very much. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Omar? Hello? Yes. Uh, in the beginning, great thanks for Dr. Royal and all the participants. I have uh, two uh, questions, please, Dr. Royal. That is yes. about uh, the rexus. Okay. Uh, I, I am doing the rexus from the main wound because I'm using the forceps. Uh, I have uh, sometimes problems from the sub incision about. I want to advise this. This first question. Second one, during the height section and delineation, uh, sometimes uh, the nucleus doesn't rotate. Is the problem in the dissection or mainly the delineation? And uh, if I put. Uh, doesn't rotate, that is dissection. You have to do dissection from several po uh, points to make sure that yeah. your wave has, has moved. And every time you do a dissection, you have to gently 
make sure that you uh, it, it make the, the fluid that has accumulated in the back of the, uh, of the on the on the pseudo capsule in front of the pseudo capsule you make sure that this fluid has uh, uh, come out uh, so if it doesn't rotate it's mainly this section definitely it's this section definitely yeah. Yeah. don't use balance with it because you have the news that uh, this is the news that's resisting you so uh, or that's keeping the the, the 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 capsule in place or the lens in place so you need to use multiple points uh, hybrid dissection to make sure that eventually at the end uh, the whole uh, uh, cortex is dissected from the anterior, from the uh, lens capsule. Uh, the first question was uh, oh, the the sub incisional uh, rex. Well, if you're using the the the, the rexus forceps, what you need to do is when you reach the point of two o'clock here or ten o'clock here, then you should never release your uh, your your uh, the capsule. You have to take the the, the, the the one transverse stroke. You have to take one transverse stroke that will give you the whole curve, and you don't take a small stroke and then stop and try to grasp again. Trying to grasp the the, the capsule under the incision is an impossible mission. So you reach the point of uh, two o'clock, and then you grasp your 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 uh, your rexus. And you go to the transverse position that takes the whole arc this way, and then you take your uh, your your uh, uh, flat again, and you take it uh, the upper uh, uh, the, uh, the forward movement that takes you the other. Uh, do you see it's uh, better to do from the side port? Uh, I I definitely recommend the side port. I don't do any. I haven't done any rexes with uh, rexes forceps. For like the past twelve years. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Uh, the last question is about the time. I'm taking Doctor Ahmed Ginga. Doctor Ahmed. Hello. Ahmed. Hello. Yes. I'm at the Kuwait Zayed. And Salim. Thank you about your uh, great presentation. Thank you very much. I have one question. Okay. What you are going to do in cases of the procedure bullet cut at the section? Uh, any any special, hydro, any special complete hydro the section in posterior polar cataract is a very dangerous thing to do because you will blow the posterior capsule. What you can do is you do a spokes of uh, uh, the section that make that you make sure it doesn't reach the, the posterior part. Uh, sometimes you don't have to do that, but this is what you can do: is you do spokes of the hydrant section that reaches only the the, the mid uh, mid periphery here, and then you use uh, uh, a direct chop technique. Uh, usually, a vertical chop technique is a, is a better technique, so you don't have to do any rotations. Or you can do the V uh, technique, and, and that's a, a advanced thing. I don't want to discuss it in a, in, a, in a primary course like this. So, uh, primary uh, main thing is don't do uh, normal hydro dissection into the anterior capsule. Uh, uh, normal hydro dissection if you have a polar cap. No, don't do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tofi, uh, I think I over exceeded my time. I'm really sorry. Dr. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your nice presentation and this beautiful course. Thank you very much. Uh, can you answer my question, please, <laughs> if you don't mind? Of course, yes. Uh, do you recommend in your capsule rexes to have an optimal size 5 or 5.5 in each in all cases or in case of like soft cataract make it a little bit larger and or in hard cataract make it a little bit smaller or you do just an optimum size of capsule rexes? I go for the optimum size all the time, 5 millimeters. I don't, I, 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 I'm comfortable with it. I, I do it and I, I can, I can, I, the, the, how hard my my cataract is controls my technique of of the of If I uh, if, if I have a problem with this use, it still uh, affects my technique of phacomalification. My rexus is usually the same. I don't uh, I don't recommend smaller because smaller uh, is uh, is is going to make make your surgery uh, terrible and it's going uh, it you know, jeopardize phimosis later on and uh, it increases the chances of having uh, more PCO 
And a larger one uh, also increases the chance of having a PCO because it's not flatted on the, on the IOL. Uh, so an optimal size is the best, and uh, I always go for five. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Well. Thank you very much for your presentations. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Well, for this nice presentations, and also we will have Dr. Well, inshallah, next year and uh, next week. Sorry, uh, we will give the course of uh, the third part of fake of course. Now, I would like to uh, welcome again uh, my dear prof. دكتور أحمد مصطفى عبد الرحمن وأنا برضو بقدم خالص التعازي لحضرته وشكرا جزيلا لانضمامه لنا بالرغم من الموقف اللي حصل وربنا يرحم المغفور لي وإن شاء الله يسكن المسيح الجنات دكتور أحمد مصطفى تفضل معنا يا فندم السلام عليكم دكتور محمد thank you very much good afternoon everybody it's a great pleasure to be with you in this very successful uh, full conference and actually I used to hear uh, single talks but the full conference prepared in this way so thank you to Dr. Muhammad Taufi and the friends of course they are the two tremendous uh, very uh, fruitful work thank you very much and thank you for your words for your blessing words and actually I need this at the moment uh, and uh, I, I need also the prayers to my uncle because he was a great man really Thank you very much. And I will move now to the uh, my topic. And before I um, uh, yes, continue. Uh, uh, yes. Before I start, I just want to express my happiness of having uh, friends and colleagues, uh, brilliant friends and colleagues participating. Dr. Wa'ili Gindi with his excellent presentation. And I'm expecting excellent talks from Dr. Walid Tamsawi and Dr. Magdi Musa. So that it's a great pleasure to have such a nice gathering. Uh, today I will focus on the management of primary glaucoma. And I mean primary glaucoma, just primary glaucoma. It is just uh, a short file that I'm a professor of ophthalmology in Cairo University and a glaucoma consultant. And I am the founder of the Egyptian Society of Continuous of Islamic Education, uh, a society that I'm really so proud of it and its performance. And I'm um, also the owner of the Giza Specialized Eye Center, which is a center for glaucoma management and education. And now we are in the era of COVID-19. So that, uh, how do we fight this? Uh, we actually fight this through science. So that, that's where I, uh, that this is our job, and that's what we are really doing, uh, that to fight uh, to enrich our knowledge in, in, uh, in ophthalmology. And I think what's happening nowadays is a very decent way of delivering information. And now, before we start, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, can we go for the poll questions? Yes, which one you want, sir? Uh, let us start. Uh, how frequent do you see glaucoma patients? Okay, now I'm launching the pool in front of you, dear ladies and gentlemen, my colleague, please make a voting. Interesting. So the majority uh, could see glaucoma patients so frequently. Interesting. And none of the responses that I don't see. Yes. Yeah. Very, very reasonable. I'm in the pool now. We have yes, about... Please. 58% they share their experience, 60% uh, they say they say we have a very frequent C glaucoma patient, and 40% they say occasional. Interesting, great. Let us move to the second question, please, Dr. Muhammad. Yes. Uh, regarding how do you often perform gonioscopy? The poll again yes. in front of two dear colleagues, can you vote? Yes. So how, how often do you perform gonioscopy? Interesting. So every glaucoma patient, no, I don't do gonioscopy at all. Yes, I do, but not to every patient. Okay, that's quite interesting. So that I, I see the majority is that, uh, let us see the results, Mohammed. Yes. Uh, we have about 60% share with us their experience. Uh, 47 say they, that they, they do uh, to every glaucoma patient. Uh, 32, they say no, 
they don't do colonoscopy and about 54 percent 54 yes say yes but not to every patient that's very interesting and that's a very good introduction to the lecture actually so um for the third question adherence to therapy in primary open angle glaucoma is almost 90 percent is this a right or wrong statement you think for the patient, yeah, okay. adherence to therapy means that they are using the therapy exactly as prescribed. Yes. Okay. And now the result about 40, uh, 43 say false. This is the false statement. 35 say it's a true statement. And 22 say they don't know. Yes, this is very realistic, okay. Then let us move to the uh, fourth question that uh, chronic angle closure glaucoma is by a, an acute attack of angle closure glaucoma. Is that right? Or wrong? Yes, it So the results are about 60% say it's false and 30% say true. Okay, good. And let us speak to the last question that trabeculectomy is the best management option for patients with chronic end closure glaucoma. True or false or I don't know. and false are always in a competition. 50, 55 percent, okay. they say it's a false statement. Okay, good. Now let us move to the uh, presentation itself. Now, the aim of this presentation is just we have a lot of knowledge uh, and then uh, when it comes to practice and application of this knowledge is not always the scenario because you can know a lot of information, but you apply the wrong information in practice. So that what I really see that, that, that that's the biggest problem, that a lot of knowledge, then when it comes to the implementation, then we can get troubles. Then, and the aim of this lecture actually to get you to what I really do. I'm a glaucoma consultant. I just want to share you the experience. Um, what I'm really doing uh, regarding the glaucoma patients, and hopefully we can get a consensus together. Uh, the, the lecture will focus on primary glaucoma, and I mean glaucoma, a patient with established glaucoma, with elevated intraocular pressure, and with glaucomatous optic neuropathy with functional and structural damage. So there is no confusion about that. An established glaucoma case, and I mean primary, an absence of a secondary cause for glaucoma, and it's not a refractory glaucoma, but it's just a straightforward uh, glaucoma. So it's a case like that, a patient presenting with glaucomatous optic neuropathy and elevation of the intraocular pressure with this structural and functional effect. Very straightforward case. I'm not going to talk about um, cases regarding the confusion diagnosis or if the patient has glaucoma or not. No, this is not the main state of my treatment. So this is not the main state. A patient with recurrent to glaucoma or secondary glaucoma, neovascular glaucoma, no, they will be presented in another lecture. So when I have a patient just sitting in front of me having elevation of the intraocular pressure and the disc is cut, and then probably it's having the functional and the structural uh, results as well, then before I put final decisions, I need to dilate the pupil because there are some conditions which could be lost if I'm going to misdirect the pupil, like early exfoliation like that. This is one of my patients, then you can imagine if the pupil is narrow, then you will make sure that being pseudo exfoliation, which is really a secondary type of glaucoma, and it's not primary glaucoma. And then what's next? Next is gonioscopy. Gonioscopy is quite important in the field of glaucoma. We need to master gonioscopy. And you, you, can, you can also lead your patients and enjoy the appearance of the angle like that, like what I'm doing, you can go to the photography or video. Then I have a set of lenses. This is the three mirror, and this is the one mirror of volume lens, and this is the Latina lens used for laser trabeculoplasty, and this is the four mirror of volume lens. 
which I really like very much. We have different forms of that. So this is the set which I've used in all the time on all patients. And the classification of glaucomas into, into um, open angle and angle closure is of critical importance, actually. Hello? We can hear you, Dorubo. It's very clear. Yes. Yes, it is just the slide is not uh, moving forward. Just okay. Okay, so it's the condition is like that. When you have an open angle or angle closure glaucoma, it looks like a crossroad. So with different destinations, so that we need to know that these of information. Yes, and this is the picture of open angle glaucoma just for invasion. We will see the, the short plan sometimes it's pigmented. So Mohammed, you hear me? You hear me? You are stop sharing now. Stop sharing. Okay, okay, I'll see that. We can hear you very quiet, very good, but no share screen. Yes. 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 So now this is the angle of open angle glaucoma where we can see the Schwarz spine, which is the termination of the desmet membrane, and then we can see the trabecular meshbat, which is the circumferential structure. And this is very important landmark. And then you can see the scleral spare, the white line immediately below the uh, the trabecular meshwork and then the ciliary body. Of course, we can comment on the uh, the shape of the peripheral iris as well. Now, this is an angle closure. So now you can appreciate the difference. We can't see anything. It's just the iris and the cornea. This is, of course, this is the most obvious form of angle closure. And now this is the differences with the open angle and the closed angle. So there is no way to mistake those two angles and again there is a cross road here which is very critical for the decision if the patient is having narrow angle like that we need to do a kind of indentation that's why i like the four mirror lens it indents the center of the pony and at that time you can see the trabecular meshwork that will differentiate between just a positional closure or just the peripheral of the iris is coming close to the trabecular meshwork or there is a synical closure where the iris is accurate actually to the pony so now we're having open angle and the angle closure glaucoma. And to the left, you can see how the open angle looks like, the beep or normal anterior chamber. And again, we don't depend on Van Herrick method, which evaluates the anterior chamber. I know it can guide you, but it is not the perfect in 100% of patients you need to do with us. And this is the condition in open angle glaucoma with the pathologist here. With the angle closure glaucoma, we are having shallow anterior chamber, and the pathology actually is here with the iris is very close to the lens and the equus is accumulated in the posterior chamber, pushing the peripheral out. Now we will focus on the primary open angle glaucoma. If you diagnose your patient, it's just a clinical diagnosis, elevated intraocular pressure coupled in the angles of open eye, okay, it's a primary open angle glaucoma. Then some factors I need into my consideration for the decision, which is general factors, including the age of the patient, including the positive history of the disease. Is the patient having bronchial asthma? We need to ask specifically about that. Is the patient having tightness in the breast or having actual asthma before that, uh, before giving any medication? You know, some medications are contraindicated. And we also we ask about the cardiovascular condition. If the patient is having systemic hypertension, we need to know that because that will help in the diagnosis and in the management. Then some ocular factors critically important, including the level of the intraocular pressure, and then basic investigations we have, like the visual team, OCT, and central corneal thickness. These are the basic investigations. And then how the optic nerve looks like, and then the ocular surface is also important in the decision-making for the therapy. And it's just simply by putting fluorescein strips on the surface of the eye, if you can get on stage of the cornea, and you can see the marginal tear strip so that and the in disappearance time, so that with, with with that simple test you can actually evaluate the cornea surface. Now, after putting all all these uh, factors into consideration, you can think what's my target here? 
my target is actually to lower the intraocular pressure according to the severity of the disease. And generally, as the disease is severe, you need to get you need to get your intraocular pressure to a lower level if you can do that. Generally speaking, patients with early damage of pressure around 20 is fine. Moderate damage in the high teens is fine. With the advanced foot damage in the low teens is fine. But I just want to say a, a, a nice piece of information that according to the results of advanced glaucoma intervention study, none of the patients with an intraocular pressure of 18 or less develop progression of glaucoma due to the follow-up. So that, that should be a good news for everybody. Now, the management options for patients with primary open angle glaucoma include a medical therapy, laser therapy, prophylactic surgery. I can think in that way. I will start with medication, but then I move to laser therapy and move to surgery. This is a very algorithmic way of thinking, which we usually don't know. But it could be non algorithmic. I'll go for the best for that patient. So I need to think what the best fits with my patient. Now, let us think of this patient, patient number one, a 55 year old lady. She's a doctor. She's having a moderate disease with pressure of 28 and 25. Let's just start a discussion with the patient with all the possible options here because she's having a lot of options that we can go through. The patient opts for laser therapy profile. And then what happens? We still, the patient need some information regarding how the effect of trabeculoplasty and I need to deliver those information to the patient that we got reduction of intraocular pressure around 18% during the uh, 36 month follow up. And then that was associated with the marked reduction of the medications at the same time. So that the patient needs that piece of information. What happened, this is the machine and we adjust the power on 0.7 millijoule. This is the only factor that we adjust. Otherwise the spot size and the duration they are obstructed in the machine. And then I take the patient to the machine and then I will treat the angle. I usually I treat 360 degrees of the angle using uh, 100 shots. And the treatment is actually easy because it's just a visualized trabecular meshwork and then we start in the trabecular meshwork and then we can get some bubbles. What happened to this patient that she received three treatments of SLT over five years and now she is no treatment and the pressure is 20 in one eye 16 in the other eye with the stabilization of the structure and function. So this is a good result. But again, we cannot have such a good result in every patient and sometimes we are giving great, having great results in some other patients. And these are some data that support the laser trabeculopathy. Please, that SLT can be used as a primary treatment or a supplementary treatment of patients using a lot of medications and wants to reduce the medication. Yeah, there is a place for SLT. The point is that give enough time for the therapeutic response because sometimes you treat and then you want to get an immediate response. Sometimes if this is not the situation, you need to wait especially for the patients who are relatively young. Patient number two, 60 year old lady, moderate primary open angle glaucoma as you see and the situation here and the patient opted for medical treatment. I just offered laser trabeculoplasty and offered the medical treatment and then the patient opted for medical treatment and I know with medical treatment, we need to start with monotherapy. So this is very important. Whatever the stage of the disease, we start with monotherapy. And the piece of information we need to know that according to the potency of reducing the intraocular pressure, we have the prostaglandin, the non-selective beta blockers, then we have the alpha agonist, and then the selective beta blockers, and the topical carbonic anhydride receptors. That's why usually we don't start with those medications. We start with prostaglandins or non-selective beta blockers, and mostly prostaglandin nowadays. So I start with monotherapy and be sure that the, the percentage of adverse to therapy is not more than 70% when you are using a monotherapy. So you need to encourage your patients all the time for the use of medication. And the recommendation, not more than two bottles, not more than twice application per day. With two bottles, you can have four ingredients nowadays. So the maximum we have four ingredients in two bottles. Definitely you need to follow up your patient. So you can't leave your patients with dryness and pigmentation and the patient is irritated. You can't leave your patient like that. You need to interfere with that situation. The intraocular pressure is perfect, but, but the patient, you cannot leave your patient like that. Yeah. With the ocular surface after staining, if the patient is having dryness like that patient, and then you can offer your patient preservative free anti glaucoma eye drops. And you can see like that, that before and after, before the, uh, before using the uh, preservative free and after, how much of the difference and the patient appreciated such a difference? 
a patient with irritated ocular surface due to medication, then you push towards the surgery. This is not bad. A patient who cannot tolerate the side effects, push towards surgery. Now, a patient, a female who is 47 year old female, she just came with blurring vision. And then we discovered that intraocular pressure is 47 and 40 on no treatment. So it is again the theme of patients. The angles are open, and her father is almost uh, blind from the glaucoma. The patient opted for medical therapy. Then I started to give her medication. Yes, it's okay. And I got a reduction of pressure of 71%. But what happened is progressive elevation of the intraocular pressure, and then we need to go for surgery. And then if the patient is young, remember that uh, patients with joint denial or open angle glaucoma, the majority will need surgery. So that like 85% will need surgery. So you know in advance, these are surgical patients. The patients with the young with long history of disease on multiple medications and the disease is not controlled and push towards the surgery, don't wait. A patient, a 30 year old patient, and then is having disease pushed towards surgery. The surgical options we have could be tropicalectomy, as you see, and then the surgery which I really love and I adopt is the non-penetrating surgery, which I will show you a video about that. And then we start by having a tonic space conjunctiva. Sometimes we do a good death, or if the bleeding is not too much, we just give a cold saline and then uh, give the chance for those measures like the pressure of both saline, and then we can continue. I don't like to do a lot of that uh, reaction because this can bite fibro. And then I'm using the crescent plate for the dissection. Again, pushing for saline can, um, can push the blood until we are having two or three bleeders. We can diatomize those directly. Then dissection of the first flap, we will get to the cornea. And then we will start fashioning the second flap. That's why it's called deep sclerectomy. We need to get a second deep layer of sclera and then we'll, we will excite. The second flap is just within the context of the first flap. It shouldn't be of the same size, just inside, inside. And then we dissect the deep flap almost to the level of the ciliary body. And then we can see ciliary body at the beginning, there is no problem. And then we continue the section and leaving a very, very thin layer of a sclera. And if we are in this plane, that will take us automatically to Schlem's canal. And we want to open the Schlem's canal because after the Schlem's canal, we will find the trabecular meshwork that is best related. So the whole secret of this surgery is to go deep with the dissection of the deep flap like that. And again, the end of the sclera is called the scleral spur. It's a very sharp white line. You need to find this sharp white line, otherwise you are not in the correct place. And this is not, sometimes I will show you a case, we can continue the scleral spur. So this is the scleral spur. Immediately after the scleral spur, we will open the shrimp canal. And after we open the schlem canal, what happened is just we will get circulation of the equus through the trabecular meshwork because schlem canal, the structure underneath schlem canal is the trabecular meshwork. So again, we continue the forward di dissection here. We just take care we might damage it. This is called the trabecular definite window because it is just the trabecular meshwork and the peripheral definite membrane. And by nature, the trabecular meshwork and this membrane is isolating. And now these are the ends of Schlem's canal. You can see we can introduce a cannula inside the Schlem's canal. And once we get into the Schlem's canal, we all get blood coming from the Schlem's canal because the pressure starts to go down and we can remove the floor of the Schlem's canal. That will help further circulation as well. So at this stage, we will cut the deep flap. That's why it's called deep sclerectomy. We apply anti-metabolite, and here I'm, I'm applying high viscosity urine, and the surgery is usually switched whether to the deep lab or to the conjunctive. Now, this is another difficulty. I just I wanted to show this because here we are dissecting the superficial flap, and um, it's like a triangle. Uh, it doesn't make a big difference whether it's triangular, rectangular, or other shapes. But again, I'm not doing uh, a lot of uh, diatomy because still I can't see. And I now I got to the periphery of the body. Uh, this is the first flap. I did not dissect the second flap yet. And I will now start the section of the deep flap. And you know the structure immediately underneath is the ciliary body, as you can see here. So that I will start raising the deep flap. I, I like to see the gray color of the ciliary body. And then I, yes, now we can see the color of the ciliary body here. 
and then we just get above and then we proceed forward. What happens during the distraction is that we can open the sclera before getting to the scleral spur. Now here, I'm not quite sure if this is the scleral spur because the scleral spur has to be very fine line. So this is not the situation. Here I expose the tibia body. What happened, I'll just go above that leaving another thin layer of the sclera and then continue the dissection until the Schlenz canal is open. And at this stage, this is the uh, this is the scleral spur. A sharp white line. Here it wasn't. So now I left the celiac body without damaging the celiac body. Just we take care of that, and then we open the Schlemm's canal. What will happen here? That after we open the Schlemm's canal, the the pressure will go down, and the celiac body will retract. So there is no problem with that, and also it might be helpful because the equus can go through uh, this uh, defect into the suprachoroidal space. So with that, I feel it's okay then I will also remove the floor of the Schlemm's canal because this will add more to the circulation. And then I will cut the uh, deep flap and you will see the defect is getting smaller and smaller until it almost disappears. So that this is one of the difficulties that we can get, but it is again very manageable and we can see good circulation as seen in this patient. Now a patient with cataract and open angle glaucoma. The decision actually that have been patients with cataract and open angle glaucoma, we need to remove the cataract because it is visually significant, but at the same time, cataract removal in patients with open angle glaucoma will not reduce the result in significant reduction of the intraocular vision. That's why we need to add the glaucoma operation. And here I'm, I'm putting my tomato, like, like the trabeculectomy because it's an external filtering operation to just more safer. And then I move to the uh, lens removal and placement of the intraocular lens. And then I will get back to my surgical chart. I have dissected the first flap, then, then I will dissect the second flap. So patients having significant cataract should have their cataract removed. And if the disease is at moderate or advanced, we should do a glaucoma operation at the same time. We should not rely on cataract as a, a way for removal or improvement of their pressure. So getting to the best option, patient number one needed at LP, second patient medical treatment to take care of the complications of therapy. And then patient number three, then I started medical, then I shifted to surgery. Jovenile open angle glaucoma, I started with surgery. Patient with cataract and glaucoma, safe and glaucoma operation. So to get to the best decision, I have to put some consideration just left here, the life expectancy, the stage of the disease, the reaction the adverse reactions of the drugs and the, the patient preference has to be put into consideration. The presence of cancer, get the best out of your option, which means if the pressure goes up after the breast me, I will just uh, go after this so that I will not uh, put the patient back on medications. No, I have something in my hand to do. And then the status of the other eye and definitely the availability of this drug. This like SLT is not available everywhere, but it's available around you. Please try to get the best out of this. Now, whatever the management option you opt, you need to go for follow-up. And the frequency will depend upon the situation, the stabilization of the structure and function. And I think Dr. Walid Tantawi will give a nice talk about the, uh, the OCT in the pump. You might ask about what's coming up with the open angle of the some eye drops like latanoprostine bound and Ropressa or Nitrosidium. Some makes with some makes appearing and some makes disappearing from the market. And the new drug delivery system, like putting the um, the prostaglandins as a canalicular implant, and also having the matoprost string, and to have the matoprost uh, slow release injected into the anti chamber. And it just got FDA and released to the market, and we participated in this study. Uh, and we can have some, uh, like eye stands uh, inserted in the trabecular meshwork and contains a lot of prostaglandin. So that was summary of the open angle glaucoma. Then I will move with you to the angle closure glaucoma to see how uh, do we take the decisions in those patients. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, are you following me? Yes, yes. Yes, we are all following you, sir. Great, yes. Now I will go to the, uh, the angle closure glaucoma because it's a bit a very important topic as well. Um, that's the situation with the frank angle closure glaucoma. Now, to differentiate between open angle and angle closure glaucoma, if you are able to see the scleral there beautifully, then this is an open angle glaucoma. 
if you just see the trabecular meshwork, and then this is an angle closure glaucoma, or if you don't see anything like here, it's definitely an angle closure glaucoma. But I think the landmark here is the scleral spare. If you see scleral spare, open angle, otherwise it's angle closure glaucoma. Then I will show you some patients like this patient. She was a lady who developed uh, more than one attack of angle closure glaucoma, and then she underwent a beautiful trabecular And then, in a couple of weeks, the patient developed galloping character. And then we have to manage this. And then you can see the situation that removal of character in those, in those eyes is not a piece of cake. Now, there is an Argentina lab, as Dr. Ware just had shown us. And then I tried to stay, but despite that capsule access was not okay. And then the surgery is almost a blind surgery. And then I have to remove the epithelium. So that was the consequence of performing trabeculectomy following an attack of angle closure glaucoma. The patient developed galloping with cataract, and then you need to manage. You cannot. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but the screen is not shared. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Is that okay? Yes, now it's okay, sir. Okay, okay. So now this is the patient I was just talking about. The patient got more than one attack of angle closure and the decision was to do trabeculectomy. And now after a couple of weeks, she got cataract. Now you can see the cataract. The cataract is really difficult here with the Argentina lab I just had said, and then working in almost a very blind situation and for that, we have to remove the corneal epithelium to help ourselves a little, so that, the, that those those consequences are all the result of performing trabeculectomy. Because the trabeculectomy was so successful, but there is a good chance of developing galloping up the cataract. So that was one situation. Now, a 50-year-old patient who was one-eyed and underwent combined psychotrap. It was chronic angle closure glaucoma, and actually this was not uh, one of my patients, but I have uh, some other disasters. But we can see this patient, what happened. The patient came with this situation. Remember, he's a one-eyed patient. He received combined surgery, and what happened? A lot of hypotony, and the iris is completely adherent to the periphery of the body. And what happened? The eyes with chronic angle, with angle closure, they do not tolerate any kind of hypopnea because the anterior chamber is already shallow and the eye is already small. So what happened here that I'm trying to remove the whole necrotic conjunctiva that developed after the use of anti-metabolite. I, I, I will try to stop the filtration at all. I got a large scleral flap, as you can see, just manually fashion, and then I'll put matrix switches to try to fix this flap to the sclera. And definitely, I don't have a conjunctiva that they can push. I need to get conjunctiva, and then I will go inside to remove the iris. And definitely, you know that my heart is beating strongly because I'm afraid of stripping the coronary endothelium itself. So I'm, I'm just trying to go as slow as much as I can. If I'm going to leave the iris as move to the cornea, the cornea will decompensate that. So I'm just working slowly from one side port, then getting the iris and then getting to the other side port and trying to separate the iris that's actually to the, uh, the cornea. And you can see 360 degree adhesions. What happened in this eye? There was an overfiltration with the anterior chamber already shallow and then resulted in the formation of extensive peripheral anterior like that. So now I actually succeeded in uh, reformation of the anterior chamber. But again, this is a one eye patient what happens here that besides cataract, the patients received as well um, uh, glaucoma operation. Now that's the picture. Uh, one year after the operation, we're having um, we're having a formed anterior chamber, and we're having this is clearer. So, uh, and here you can see the formed anterior chamber. But again, you know how much is it stressful to do that uh, for the uh, for a one eye patient that was the picture pre and post. Uh, now, this is one of my patients. Uh, I did this patient combine cycle trap, and what happened? She got malignant glaucoma in the post operative period. Then I have to go for anterior vitrectomy more than one time to control the pressure. And you can see this is the trap and this is the intraocular lens, so that she developed malignant glaucoma. And then um, 
I, I did direct cycle photocoagulation because the pressure was too high after uh, a couple of uh, attacks, a couple of surgeries performing anti-demonstration. So again, adding trabeculectomy took me to a complication. Again, that was a combined surgery and the patient required a lot of needling in the post office because the child was not actually working. Uh, and this is one of my patients, which I was so happy with his combined surgery, but I just asked the patient, please look down. And then when the patient look down, just uh, you can see that the trabeculectomy nothing it doesn't work. So that it looks like if I did not do trabeculectomy in the first place. So that the patient is benefiting from the only cataract surgeon. So as an initial management in patients with chronic angle closure glaucoma, starting or adding trabeculectomy, an angle closure glaucoma is actually full of complications. Just we need to remember that. And definitely mistakes are tools that you are learning. Uh, now, what happened in the case number nine, that a 67-year-old male with advanced chronic angle closure glaucoma, the angles are zero. And then the pressure you can see is 42 and 38 under full medical treatment. Then I decided to do FACO and then to help with some polyosinophilitis. That was the appearance, the operative. Now during the operation, the lens here is almost clear. This is not the issue. In patients with angle closure glaucoma, we need to remove the lens if the lens is not clear because the lens is responsible for that glaucoma. And now I have implanted the intraocular lens and then I will get the viscoelastic and ingest my call to try to deepen the angle of the eye and deepen the anterior chamber. And then I will take my Swan Jacob uh, gonio prism and I will try, try to get to the angle with the spatula and to try to sweep the iris from the 360 degrees, getting to expose the trabecular meshwork that was completely zero. So this angle, this surgery is called gonio sinusitis. Which, uh, which, which is followed by injection of air here because I think injection of air uh, repeatedly will help more in the uh, reformation of the anterior chamber and the formation of the angle. Now, this is the picture in the post operative period. Quite interesting. Now, I can see the trabecular measures and definitely darker areas of previous adhesions, but the angle is at least anatomically open. I'm not quite sure that the, the physiology, how, how well it be, but, but anatomically, the angle is beautifully open. And then that was um, what that was I'm doing in the old days that I removed the cataract and then I moved for goniosinicolysis. But with the goniosinicolysis, I used the forceps, which I stopped nowadays because it is very traumatizing. I go to the periphery, I go to the periphery of the iris and will try to strip it from the angle. But I think this is a bit very traumatic to the iris. So I stopped doing that. I only use the spatula. Another situation here we have just stopped. I, I did the FACO, I put the intraocular lens, and then I will go to remove the iris that's completely adherent to the angle and expose the trabecular measure. But again, I stop that kind of, uh, of practice of using the process. I just go with the spatula, just horizontal separation, and then pushing the periphery of the iris. That will help a lot in opening up the uh, angle. Now, this, uh, this might be another uh, case, which is um, patients having attacks of angle closure sometimes end up in having the pupil uh, permanently dilated. And this is not good because it will help the reformation of peripheral anti Now, a 40-year-old lady with angle closure glaucoma just a couple of weeks, and the pressure is now 45 in their full medical treatment. The intraocular lens calculation was 26. And you expect from the small size of the eye to have a hyperopic refraction and the lenses that are big uh, lenses. So the decision here is that basically I want to remove the lens. You know, now that I need to remove this lens. The lens is clear, yes, but the lens is incriminated in the pathogenesis of the local. Now I will follow the rules of the Kurwa in, in doing capsular access, and that removal of the lens is not very difficult. And then again, you need to keep those eyes pressurized for the time so that I keep the infusion until I ingest the viscoelastic because hypotony is not good for those eyes. They can develop malignant glaucoma even intraoperative. So that now I put the intraoperative lens and uh, at that time I used to go with the forceps and they try to separate the iris that acting to the angle. And again, I am I'm applying some stretch because the pupil was really permanently dilated. I tried to fully stretch with my cone and I could not. 
so that I decided that I will, um, so I decided that I will repair this iris because, um, because, and I think repairing the iris would be helpful to those eyes. So that just, I took one stitch and I like the, the just suture and then four to stick me. Uh, and then I could split the pupil and doing gonioscopy and the angle is now open and I, and I feel happy. Now, I did not perform a dive glaucoma operation. I just opened the angle. I just repaired the iris and the patient in the post operative period. And interestingly, the patient is enjoying a beautifully controlled intraoperative patient without anti glaucoma medications now for almost a year. So now this is the process of going inside nucleolysis, which is to go and separate the iris that's adjunct to the angle. There is a lot of controversy regarding the efficacy of these procedures compared to FACO. But again, it is some intermediate procedure between FACO and FACO trabeculectomy. I learned from the practice over the years that FACO trap in eyes with chronic angle closure glaucoma is a big trap and actually will put you into many troubles. So that it will take you to unpredictable dark world of complications. The least complication is ineffectiveness. Imagine this is the least complication. Otherwise, you can get a lot of complications like malignant glaucoma, um, hypoxony, um, peripheral anti-sinusia. So that again, I'm not doing trabeculectomy. So cataract surgery is replacing trabeculectomy in angle closure glaucoma. And this is the recommendation of the Royal College. So again, just extraction, you can add something else, but it's just length that you need to buy. What I really do nowadays in patients with closure glaucoma means the pressure is high, having damage to the nerve, structural and functional damage, and the angle is closed. The diagnosis is chronic angle closure glaucoma, similar to open angle glaucoma, but the angle is closed. They are having different management options. Now, I can go for just FACO, or I can go for FACO uh, gonium sinuculysis. And if the pressure remains uncontrolled, I can go for trabeculectomy following FACO gonium sinuculysis or FACO. It is just from practice, I have been doing this for almost a couple of years, and none of my patients require addition of trabeculectomy. And according to the literature, that is, do you, do you need trabeculectomy? It's like 15% very small percentage that you will do. But if you do a trabeculectomy, the eye will be in a much favorable situation because now you have left the conjunctiva intact and the after cycle, the anterior chamber is beautifully formed and the, the depth is quite good. So you can do surgery on a much better, uh, in a much better situation. But phaco trap, no phaco trap. Now I don't do phaco trap. So if you want to add something to the phaco, when you sign equilatus to or trabeculectomy, again, you can see the differences the advantages of trabeculectomy that it can safeguard against the post of the pressure spikes and if you are using the force that you can get I do that. Otherwise, with the, all these advantages, flat anti chamber, hypotony, malignant glaucoma, blood related complications, endophthalmites, questionable efficacy. So that again, adding trabeculectomy the angle closure glaucoma, I stopped this practice. Actually, I did not regret a single case of FACO alone in chronic angle closure glaucoma. I did not regret a single case of phaco gonium and I regretted many cases of phaco trabeculectomy and definitely of trabeculectomy alone in chronic angle closure glaucoma. Now, if we think of the role of the PI in early cases of angle closure glaucoma, now this is one of my patients, a patient who is 16 year old male, and then presented with a moderate disease with chronic angle closure. And at that time, I decided to do the patient PI just to help this patient and then I'm quite sure that the PI is patent, as you, as you can see from the red reflex right now. And the patient came after a couple of years. What happened? And the patient got progression of the condition. The pressure is 30 and 28. And now I have to put my patients on treatment. The PIs are patent, but those patent PIs do not prevent the progression of the disease. I did the patient OCT. And unfortunately, I found the patients have progressed over those two years because the TIs were not so beneficial to the patient. Now, we have landmark study right, uh, right now, which is called the Eagle study. They have compared lens extraction to PI in patients with established uh, chronic angle closure with glaucoma or even with chronic angle uh, uh, closure with the pressure is 30 and the, there is still 
there is no uh, it's still the visual field is good. And with those patients, and actually they found good effect of the uh, good long term effect of cataract extraction compared to the PI. And then this is another study that the cataract surgery is even much more beneficial. So in conclusion, in angle closure glaucoma nowadays, phaco immunification has largely replaced trabeculectomy and has largely replaced laser PI. So if you can push your patient towards phaco immunification, that will be quite good. So that again, how can I put such a critical decision of removal, a clear lens, without performing good gonioscopy and affirming and confirming my diagnosis. So again, if I have diagnosed the patient with primary glaucoma, the, the crossroad here is gonioscopy. So I will go in one direction with the open angle glaucoma. It's basically a medical condition. I have the options of the SLT, of the drops and surgery. So, but it's basically a medical situation. On the other hand, if it's an angle closure of glaucoma, then I will go for PECO multiplication. I can add gonioscopy if I would like. So again, this, this is a crossroad. Without gonioscopy, I can confuse options, which means I can have a patient with chronic angle closure glaucoma, and then I can put this patient or subject this patient to just eye drops and surgery. No, this is not a good decision. On the other hand, I can have a patient with open angle glaucoma, and then I do the patient phaco immunification thinking that the phaco immunification will help. No, this is not true. With the open angle glaucoma, you need to focus on the glaucoma itself rather than the catch. Dr. Muhammad. Uh, can we go for the poll again? I'm sorry for delivering a lot of information because uh, for the interest of time. Okay. So again, to the poll, we will start again with the first questions. Or you want to go for gonioscopy now, sir? Uh, yes, I think we go for the second question. Okay. We can change that. that how, how often, how often will you perform gonioscopy? Can we do it like that, Dr. Man? How often will you perform gonioscopy on the glaucoma patient? Interesting. Okay, good. So the question, how often will you perform uh, gonioscopy on your glaucoma patients? Yes, yes, we can now reach about 71%. They, uh, they agree. They will do gonioscopy. Good. Yes. Okay, now uh, for, the, uh, for the third question, I think we answered that beautifully because uh, the um, uh, address to therapy in primary open angle glaucoma is not more than 70% and that the majority have said uh, that's uh, true, yes. And then chronic angle closure glaucoma is preceded by an acute attack. The majority have said no. Yes, you are absolutely right. Almost like 20% only will have a history of an acute attack. So they but say it's false. Yes, they said false. That's true. Because actually, the, the majority of the patients... Yes, 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 I'm with you. Yes, because, yes, the answer correctly, because the chronic angle closure glaucoma is often preceded by an acute attack. No, only 20% of patients have an acute attack. Because, you know, based on that, if the patient did not develop an acute attack, you, and without performing gonioscopy, you might think that the patient is having open angle glaucoma. So that's the point. But no, the minority did develop acute attack. Then trabeculectomy is the best management option. Can we vote on this last question, uh, Mohammed? That trabeculectomy is the best management option in patients with angle closure glaucoma. I relaunched that trap. The question again, please vote. Yes. Vote. Yes. Yes. The last question: that trabeculectomy is the best option for. Okay, so that I just want to confirm the piece of information in patients with chronic angle closure. Sir, is it fault? No, it's not a primary option. No primary. Yes. 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 Much, much better. So that uh, is great. Uh, again, so I will start again that we are in this era of uh, the, this era of COVID, which is helpful in many aspects of getting uh, such uh, online education, which I think gives uh, a chance for huge attendance and the uh, changing of the, uh, the experience. And that's the way we are fighting the coronavirus uh, at those days. And thank you very much. Thank you very much.
for this nice presentation. Can we take some questions from the audience? Yes, please. Uh, yes. Dr. Ahmed Ismail. Uh, hello, sir. Thank you hello. for the presentation. It was amazing for me to have such a, a lovely and interesting uh, notes. Uh, Thank you. Actually, one point about you doing the goniotron, goniotroscopy for every patient with the glaucoma is a wrong statement because we know that in the early, every new diagnosis, every, every new glaucoma, really we do the goniotroscopy. But for example, the patient visit you after one week, after one month, we don't need to do gonoscopy. So it's a little bit along, around the statement about uh, to do a gonoscopy for every glaucoma patient. And uh, another thing, uh, the HECO gonio scler uh, sinicolysis uh, was something new for me and I have ever to do that. And it inspired me to do and to change my protocol. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. You know that. Thank you very much for your comment. But you know what happened? They they are selling the disposable gonio lenses, and the aim of this uh, disposable lens is that you do gonioscopy, then you give your patient these lens because of the appearance of the angle does change with time. Because, for example, um, you did your patient, uh, you know, your patient's chronic angle closure of glaucoma, and then you did a management, PECO or PECO bonus sinusitis. After a while, you might need to have a second look on this angle. So that again, uh, or a patient who, you know, the open angle of glaucoma, but with time, uh, he's having cataract. And so that the, the, the angle might change in configuration with time. So that we, I agree with you partially that you might not repeat the gonioscopy on already diagnosed patient, but sometimes you need to do it. Dr. Ahmed Khalaf, unmute yourself, please. Dr. Ahmed Khalaf? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Ahmed. You, as usual, you impress us uh, by each talk you do. Thanks a lot for your effort. Um, my question is, uh, yes, uh, for angle closure attacks, it's usually that we should do the emergency um, uh, treatment for it, and after stabilization, then we go for treatment. But uh, it's clear for those who have cataract over 40 that we would go for echomotification, but what about patients under 40 or their, their cataract, who is a cataract, doesn't affect their visual acuity or even has no cataract? Would we still go for fake modification or we will be, yeah, hesitated a bit? So, uh, so uh, Ahmed, your question is uh, a patient with chronic angle closure glaucoma and oh, yeah. the patient but, is below 40, yeah? Oh, sorry, no, actually, uh, angle closure glaucoma. Those who don't. Attack of angle closure glaucoma? Yes. And the patient, is, yes, you know that we see those. By, uh, you know, the, 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 the severest form of uh, angle closure of patients with nanotown. And you can see those patients with, um, they are having uh, like uh, plus 20 uh, uh, pluses or so, but they, they don't present with an acute attack. But let us go back to a patient with a straightforward situation who is having an, um, an attack of angle clo closure of glaucoma and below the age of 40. Yes? And I think for that patient, you need to work more to exclude um, uh, the possibility of plateau iris syndrome. Uh, because yes, angle closure glaucoma is common in a bit elder age, but uh, a patient with um, uh, below 40, and for those patients, I might like to do PI. Uh, if the pathologist, primary uh, angle closure glaucoma, just PI, and then uh, if doing the PI, I might like to do UBM, to see the configuration of the peripheral the eyes, if there is an evidence of plateau eyes or not, because this could be a factor as well, Ahmed, in those eyes. And if the pressure uh, continues to be uncontrolled or to get attacked after the PIs, I would go for cataract surgery. Not oh. yet. There is a chance, I know, for a peripheral iridoplasty, but I, and I think I will go for cataract surgery. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Ahmed Khalaf. The last questions with Dr. Ahmed Yahya. Dr. Ahmed Yahya, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for your uh, informative lecture. My question is about uh, if you have a patient with uh, cataract and advanced case of uh, ankle closure glaucoma, uh, what's your uh, plan or what do you do for this? 
Thank you for this question, Ahmed, because uh, uh, those are the majority of our patients. Uh, what happened is that those patients, they continue to deteriorate under medical treatment because they are treated as being an open angle glaucoma. And actually, they are not. They are angle closure glaucoma. And then they come to you at the end stages of the disease. And what happened with those patients, I just spent time with them that we need to do surgery that includes removal of the lens, even if the lens is clear. So that's, I do a gonioscopy in the first place, and then I go for removal of the lens and do goniocytic lysis. And then in the post-operative period, I put the patient on systemic carbon and hybrid inhibitors, and I evaluate the response uh, to um, surgery. And I just want to let you know that um, those are the majority of my patients, and they benefited a lot from that protocol. And you can, if you want, you can put your patient back on one hospital of medication. But again, being advanced disease is not a contraindication to surgery. And even more, if the patient is having advanced disease, you might be afraid from hypotonia. So that if you have to do an operation, you still uh, avoiding hypotonia. You know, with sacrosanct, it's, it's impossible to have hypotonia. You can get some pressure spike, and that's why you give carbonic anhydrase and aptus, and then evaluate your patient if he's going nicely or he needs another glaucoma surgery under very favorable situations. That's my protocol. Thank you, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, sorry, sir, the last question for Dr. Labib, Labib al -Dizari. Yes. Dr. Labib. Dr. Labib. Dr. Labib. Okay, just for sake of time, we will move to uh, Dr. Mohsen Iqbal. Yes. Hello. Hello, Dr. Yes. Mohsen. Sir, Professor, excellent presentation, very nice information in a very short time. I really appreciate it. I, want, I wanted to ask that how, how do you manage malignant glaucoma in these cases? Because doing anterior, uh, it's very difficult. Anterior vitrectomy, more and more laser is difficult. Should you go directly for past plan of vitrectomy or just laser PI or a rupture of the anterior cap posterior cap? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. In the first place, you need to avoid malignant glaucoma because, of course, all the management options for malignant glaucoma are not very satisfactory. So that in the first place, you need to avoid hypotony. That's why I don't leave those eyes hypotenuse intraoperative. I keep the infusion all the time. If I'm going to get the infusion out, I put the viscoelastic in. So something has to keep those eyes pressurized. Then in the post-operative period, and actually, I, I don't do trabeculectomy nowadays, so I don't I don't see malignant glaucoma actually. And that's, but if I'm doing combined surgery with that scenario, and the patient develops malignant glaucoma, and definitely there is a chance for medical treatment, giving all medications, including atrophy. Sometimes the disease can work, but in the majority of patients, you need to do something. The, the work here is that you will do a combination of anterior vitrectomy, and usually you can remove uh, the anterior hyaloid and peripheral iridectomy as well, and the posterior capsule in an area. And I have seen uh, my friends doing that. I did not perform myself because I, I used to do just um, uh, just anterior vitrectomy, and now, and also, I can help the formation of the anterior chamber with some of diode cycle photocoagulation because I think that helps in the formation of the anterior chamber. But again, this is a very avoidable situation by avoiding doing trabecular. Thank you very much, uh, my dear Prof. Dr. Ahmed Mustafa Abdul Rahman. وأكرر ثاني خالص تعازية لحضرتك يا فندم. الله يخليك يا محمد شكرا جزيلا. أشكر حضورك معنا بالرغم من الظروف اللي حصلت. Thank you very much for you. We wish you can join us again in the next week, إن شاء الله. Sure, sure. My pleasure, Allah. يعني my best wishes, my best sincere wishes for this uh, uh, tremendous effort in uh, in doing such an interesting very useful online activity. I'm really enjoying the education this way. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. So again, uh, my colleagues, uh, thank you for Dr. Ahmed Mustafa for sharing his experience and his beautiful lecture with us. Now I would like to uh, welcome all of us with Dr. Walid Tantawi, ophthalmology consultant from UK. He will present for us a keynote lecture about OCT interpretation in glaucoma.
Dr. Walid Antoy. Uh, thank you very much um, for having me, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for uh, excellent talk. It's, it's always very difficult to talk after Dr. Ahmed. It's, uh, it's a lot to uh, to take in. Uh, so I hope everybody is, is keeping safe. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Right, okay. Uh, so I'll be talking about uh, OCT interpretation in uh, glaucoma. This will be a basic interpretation talk. Uh, there will be, inshallah, another talk at uh, some time later uh, with more uh, cases and uh, uh, bottling uh, cases. I have no financial interest in any of the products. I will be discussing some products uh, in this uh, presentation. Uh, however, I'm open to uh, offers if any of the companies would like to offer me something. Right, so uh, what's the role of uh, OCT in glaucoma? It actually provides structural examination. Uh, it is objective and quantitative. And quantitative means that it is measurable. It's most useful in uh, early glaucoma uh, as an, a diagnostic uh, adjunct to clinical examination and disc photography and for monitoring uh, changes as well in the structure. So it cannot uh, stand alone as a diagnostic tool, as Dr. Ahmed said. So this uh, series uh, of OCT uh, for the same patient over three years, uh, this is a glaucoma progression uh, analysis, and we'll discuss this at the end of the uh, presentation. Um, so the RNFL uh, damage was uh, evident before any detectable uh, visual field loss. As you can see here, uh, there is an infratemporal localized RNFL defect, which was observed in the deviation map uh, in the presence of a normal visual field in October 2009. The visual field was, uh, the visual field defect was uh, detected uh, in uh, about almost a, a year later in uh, February 2010. Uh, these are the different modalities of glaucoma imaging. Uh, so there is the OCT uh, and uh, the most common ones that are in the market are the Zeiss ones, uh, the Stratus, which was the old modality and the Cirrus. And we've got the OptiView and the Topcon. So these is they uh, they are used mainly for uh, the RNFL more than uh, more than imaging the optic nerve head. It images both uh, the RNFL and the optic nerve head, but it's it's better to be used for the RNFL. Then we've got uh, the HRT, uh, which is used mainly uh, for the optic nerve head, and this almost obsolete now. And the GDX, which images the RNFL now. So we'll focus today on the uh, OCT as it is arguably the best imaging tool uh, so far. Uh, a little bit of background on OCT. Uh, OCT stands for Optical Coherence Tomography and it's been around for almost uh, 30 years. Uh, in 1991, uh, David Hong, which is a great ophthalmologist, he was a student in Harvard MIT. He conceived the idea of OCT. Uh, he's now a full professor of team patents and uh, 14 pending uh, patents. He also uh, co invented uh, the anterior segment OCT and the OCT and geography, which Dr. McLeod will speak uh, about. Uh, the OCD uses uh, multiple A scan and rabbit uh, succession, and it compares the reflection returning to scanner from tissue against reference image, as I will uh, show later. Uh, the greater the delay, the thicker uh, the tissue. So, as we can see here, just the highlighter. Right. 
so we can see here that uh, uh, here is uh, where the uh, the doctor or the technician uh, sits, and uh, the image uh, or or the or the beam moves from here. Then uh, half of it goes to the reference mirror, and half of it goes to the eye. Then uh, the beam goes back to the beam splitter, then goes back to uh, the detector where it analyzes according to the speed. So, uh, the, uh, as I said, the thicker the, the, the tissue here uh, in the patient's retina, uh, uh, the greater the, the delay. So, basically, the OCT machine compares the, uh, the ray that's coming uh, from the patient's eye and the one that's coming from the reference image. That's basically how the OCT machine works. So the types of the OCT are uh, the old time, dom uh, time domain, which is the stratus OCT, and the newer uh, spectral domain or the Fourier domain. And the most common ones that are in the market are the Cirrus and the RT view. I'll focus uh, on the Cirrus, it's the Zeiss one, because that's uh, what we use in our unit. This is the original technology, the time domain. As you can see, uh, it, it was very bad. Uh, that's, that's a scan from the 90s, it was a very bad resolution, and that's the latest uh, technology, the Fourier domain, the, the one that almost everyone has now. Uh, this is a quick comparison. Uh, as we can see, uh, the time domain was uh, operator dependent, uh, however, the spectral domain is not operator dependent at all. Uh, the area scanned uh, in the time domain is just five to six point. Uh, while in the spectral domain is 40,000 points. It uses a cube, 200 by 200. It's a cube scan. I'll skip the time domain because uh, we don't really uh, have it nowadays. Uh, so that's, uh, I'll, I'll jump now to the, uh, uh, to the Ceres OCT. It uses a cube data. Uh, as I said, uh, it's higher resolution and faster scanning and gives uh, more data unlike the old Stratus uh, OCT. Uh, it's a, an entire cube of 200, uh, uh, 200. Uh, and uh, it examines the optic nerve head and the RNFL around it. Okay, let's go to the practical part. This is uh, the uh, printout. This is an example of a Stratus OCT printout. Uh, I know there's a lot to uh, to take in, but let's break it down uh, so a bit by bit so we can uh, know how to read it systematically. So we'll start by uh, this area, which is the patient uh, and uh, exam data. In a basic clinic, mistakes can happen, and you want to make sure that you have the right OCT for the right patient in front of you. Uh, so just make sure that you've got the right name and the right hospital number and the right date of birth and the right gender. Uh, why is the date of birth important? Because the patient is compared in the machine against a similar age group. That's how the color coding map works. Uh, and uh, it's important as well because uh, the machine compares, it, uh, compares the patient uh, to himself or to herself. Uh, for uh, follow-up, as we will see in the glaucoma progression uh, analysis. These are two scans uh, at the same, on the same day. As we can see here, uh, the uh, technician just changed the date of birth from 1992 to 1929. And uh, the, the, the scan, if you look here uh, on the right, uh, for the right eye, uh, it, it's more or less glaucomatous, but when uh, we corrected the date of birth, it's more or less a healthy uh, eye. So it is, it is very important to double check the date of birth. Now let's go to the signal strength. So the scan quality, uh, the higher the, the number and closer to 10, the more reliable the scan. And that's where you see the signal strength. That's for the right eye, and this is for the uh, left eye. And for those of you who like to take screenshots, that's the time. So signal strength, if it is eight uh, and above, that's a good signal strength. If it's six or seven, is okay. 
it's not optimal, uh, but you can take it uh, and interpret it with caution and with a pinch of salt. Uh, if it's five or low, it's reliable. So that's us finished that top. Let's move to the uh, uh, the area at the bottom. That's the left eye and that's the right eye. We'll discuss now the thickness map and the deviation map. So the thickness map, which is this one and this one, normally you should see a, a bifurcated area of a hotter color uh, superior to the disk and one large area inferior to the disk. So you should see two peaks here in this area superior to the disk if the uh, patient is healthy or if the uh, person in front of you is healthy and a large area uh, of hotter color uh, which is dark uh, either yellow or, or, or red uh, that means uh, that the RNFL is uh, thick in, uh, in this area. So uh, this uh, double or triple hum appearance is reflected uh, on the RNFL thickness graph uh, as we can see here. So that's the thickness graph, we'll discuss it later. But these areas, the superior area and the inferior area, uh, reflects on the superior and inferior uh, area here. And that's the double or triple hum that we can see. Uh, that's for the thickness map. For the deviation map, these two, uh, in healthy eyes, we shouldn't be seeing any uh, hotter colors. As you can see uh, in this patient, no hot colors at all. Uh, however, the caveat with the deviation map is that in all different modalities, the normative database is a bit small. So keep that uh, in mind. And it is called deviation map because deviation means deviation from normal. Uh, the red color here, if you see any red color, it means uh, that uh, uh, less than 1% chance the results are normal. Uh, and if you see any yellow color, it's less than 5% chance the results uh, are normal. So what you want to see is hot colors on the thickness map, this one, uh, and no hot colors on the deviation map. It is important, uh, as I said at the beginning, to correlate the clinical picture to uh, the OCT scan. Uh, here's an example showing focal RNFL defect uh, correlates uh, in the clinical picture uh, to the thickness and deviation map. So if I can remove this, if you look carefully in this area, uh, you can see that there is uh, inferior uh, localized RNFL thinning. And if you look at the thickest map, you almost don't see any hot colors in this area, while in the deviation map, you see hot colors. They should correlate the clinical pictures to uh, the OCT scan. As you get used to looking at thickness maps, you will uh, become familiar with uh, what the normal thickness map looks like with the different age groups. The RNFL tends to get thinner as we grow older, uh, and uh, it, it may not necessarily uh, mean glaucoma. So as you can see here, uh, this is the age, 14, and, and this is 82. Uh, as you can see here, uh, hot colors around the optic nerve head, while here is not glaucomatous. However, uh, this orange are very thin, and that's uh, normal. So we finished the top area and the thickness uh, map and the deviation map. Let's move to the optic nerve head and RNFL parameters. The first thing uh, to look at is the disc area. Uh, it will always uh, show gray area. As you can see here, it will always uh, be gray. Uh, that's because all the disc parameters uh, uh, in all machines and there is no normative data. So someone can have a small disk or a normal size disk or a large disk. Uh, so that's why uh, the machine cannot interpret it as normal or abnormal. So a small disk or a large disk can both be normal. So that's why the, it, is, it is always uh, grayed out. Uh, however, in, in large disk, uh, if the disk is, is large uh, on the disk area, uh, everything else starting from in words will be gray. Uh, 
Right. Uh, after that, we look at the uh, average RNFL uh, thickness for the right eye and for the left eye, and RNFL uh, symmetry. Right, so uh, so this area, sorry. Right. So this area would be for the optic nerve head, and this area would be uh, for the RNF. So this one is the right eye. This one is this one is the right eye. This one is the left eye, and this one is the uh, RNFL symmetry between both eyes. I hope that's uh, that's clear. So the average RNFL and symmetry, the ones at the top, will always have a color. Uh, symmetry tends to go down with glaucoma. The other disk values, these ones, the cup disk ratio and the cup volume and the rem area are not really important. They are generally used for monitoring rather than uh, a diagnostic tool. Right, so uh, let's move downwards to uh, the center. So this, uh, these two uh, are called RNFL and near retinal rim thickness graphs. Uh, the graphs, uh, the normal results are uh, double or triple hum, as we said, uh, within the green. So as you can see here is the double hum here. And if you see another one, that's triple hum. And all should be within uh, the, the green. Uh, loss of double or triple hum uh, occurs in glaucoma, uh, and one of these will be the right eye, OD and OS, and they are overlapped here. And here you can see uh, the circular tomogram for the right and the left eye, uh, staking the curves that you can see on the deviation map and plot it into uh, a line where you can access the segmentation of the RNFL bundle. So the whole central part of the scan, just highlight it for you. So the whole central part uh, of the scan, uh, which is this one, uh, the results are compared against the normative uh, database and the results are displayed in red, yellow, and green. So if you want green charts for uh, this one uh, as well. Uh, the green uh, means that 95% uh, chance of the results are normal. The yellow means less than 5% chance the results are normal. And the red means less than 1% chance the results are, are normal. However, uh, I don't want you to interpret uh, the scan as a, a stockbroker. So uh, you should really correlate what you see in the thickness and deviation map to what you see here uh, in the center. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll just uh, skip the RT view. It's more or less the same, really, uh, compared to the uh, to the series. Uh, these are two images of the same patient. As you can see, uh, the hot color here and here are more or less the same. A little bit of thinning inferiorly uh, in both of them. So the data presented in graphs and sectors in both machines, 12 sectors, uh, here in the, uh, sorry, four sectors uh, in the uh, series and eight in the RT. I would like to argue that uh, this, this is part of the standard glaucoma workup, the ganglion cell uh, analysis. It's more or less uh, new in the newer machines, uh, and the newer machines are able to map the ganglion cell uh, layer. Uh, Macular thinning occurs in glaucoma due to ganglion cell loss, and the pattern of loss really correlates with the RNFL uh, loss pat pattern. It is used to confirm or refute uh, 
uh, your uh, hypothesis. So basically, if you have a hypothesis that uh, this patient is uh, glaucomatous uh, or not, you should take uh, a good look at the ganglion uh, cilia and see uh, if it uh, if it helps you uh, with a diagnosis. So this is how it looks like the ganglion cell uh, layer in the series and the RT view. This is the area, uh, the area we, we scan. This is the famous picture from uh, Kansky. So if you have, uh, if you have uh, any superior or inferior thinning, it should show here or here. Again, for the right or, uh, or left is, is, is the same. Right, uh, let's go uh, quickly uh, shed a light on the glaucoma progression analysis. It's a software like the one in the Humphrey Visual Field Machine. It will analyze and flag the reading as possible loss, likely loss, or uh, possible increase. Uh, you actually need the minimum of uh, three scans or three exams. But please keep in mind that the signal strength of the scans, like in this example, uh, there is a possible loss. However, the signal strength is 8 over 10 in one of them compared to 9 over 10 uh, in another one. So keep in, loss, uh, sorry, keep in mind that uh, you should have more or less the same signal strength. Uh, let's go quickly uh, through the artifacts that you can see uh, with the OCTs. So you've got algorithm failure. Uh, as you can see here. So it's data from uh, that area that the machine couldn't analyze, and it will be shown as uh, black patches in the RNFL thickness map and the corresponding uh, red or yellow area in the deviation map. So just uh, that's why I said it's, it is very important when you look at, at the scan not to look at the colors only. You need to go back to the thickness map and the deviation map to make sure that the scan uh, was okay. So this is uh, an artifactual thinning in one of my patients. It's not uh, a real thinning, as you can see here. If we just look at the colors, like a stock broker here, we, we might think that this patient has got glaucoma. However, if you go back to the thickness map and the deviation map, you will notice that it is uh, an artifactual thinning, it's not a real thinning. Uh, it's very unusual to have the RNFL thinning starting nasally uh, or temporarily, as you can see here. Uh, also, one of the things you can see a very nice uh, double or uh, triple hump here. So that doesn't match with what you see here, right? So uh, all, all, all the graphs are still in the green here. When we looked at uh, an earlier uh, scan, that was the, the patient scan, as you can see. So uh, that's without uh, the artifact. The other one is a blood signal. As you can see in this patient, this is an area of vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, in this case, uh, again, it's artifactual thinning, not a real thinning, as you can see here as well. That's uh, another example of uh, one of my patients. Uh, he was a glaucoma suspect with vitreous floaters. So uh, if you just look here, you might think that that's an early uh, superior RNFL thinning. But if you, if you look at the graphs, you'll see very nice double or triple hump appearance, uh, all in the green. So we repeated the scan and the floaters just moved a little bit further away from uh, the optic nerve head. And as you can see, very nice orange uh, thickness. So the difference between the algorithm failure and the blocked signal uh, is that the algorithm failure is usually black area, which more or less looks pixelated, as you can see. However, the block signal is a black area follows the pattern of the cause of poor signal. 
whether it is a foreign body or vitreous hemorrhage or floaters. Uh, sometimes it's a combination of both and it's hard to distinguish between the, the two. Another artifact is the disk border identification. Uh, one of the advantages of the uh, newer machines over the time domain is that it doesn't require the technician to identify the disk border manually and it uses an algorithm. Sometimes this algorithm fails, uh, especially in uh, tilted disks and in uh, like uh, myopic patients. Uh, in this patient, the black line uh, in the deviation map represents where the machine thinks uh, the disk border is. Like here, as you can see, and when you look uh, at the actual disk, it is completely uh, normal and rounded. So this will affect uh, will affect uh, all the data uh, that the machine will uh, represent. Uh, that's uh, here's an example of one of my uh, where the machine thinks that the right optic nerve head is big. As you can see here, the disc area is 3.2, okay, and that's uh, where the machine took, and that's the result. More or less glaucomatous patients. But when we uh, looked at an earlier scan, it's actually uh, a small uh, optic nerve head. As you can see, it's 1.33. So please bear this in mind. Uh, you have to correlate the clinical picture if the disc is large or not to what you have on the OCT scan. So this patient had a small optic nerve head in both eyes, as you can see here. But that's one of the artifacts of uh, the OCT uh, scan. Uh, another artifact we said about the data entry. So if you put the wrong date of birth or the technician put the wrong date of birth, uh, it will uh, give you uh, totally wrong results. So to summarize the drawbacks of OCT, uh, it cannot stand alone, only as uh, an uh, adjunct. Uh, enter test variability and fluctuation. So even if you have the same patient uh, having two scans on the same day, it can give you a slight uh, fluctuation. Uh, scanning artifacts, uh, hazy media, and there is analysis artifact, uh, usually in unusual disk uh, shape or, uh, or size. Uh, so they tend, uh, the OCT scan tend to fail us in the challenging cases like uh, the tilted disc uh, where we actually need them. Um, and I will finish with that and I'm happy to, there was like three scans I would like to discuss with you, but I'm, uh, I'm running out of time. So I'll just finish with that and there's any question, uh, please let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Walid, for these nice presentations. And we can, we have time for five minutes to take questions. So please, uh, again, I will uh, ask Dr. Ahmed Khalaf. Dr. Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Walid. Awalan, shukran kathiran, gitan gitan gadi la hadrat kabil kumpahinsam. Uh, I will just to raise the point of the importance of ganglion cell layer because you said that it's used as a confirmation for any glaucoma changes um, diagnosed through the RNFL changes, where actually ganglion cell diagnosis is uh, or ganglion cell analysis is uh, used nowadays as an early predictor for glaucoma changes, especially in myopic patients where they have dented disc for uh, particular atrophy. So yeah, I would like just to note that it's, nowadays it's even uh, recommended uh, early or uh, firstly the ganglion cell analysis before the RNA. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was, uh, that was a comment, not a question, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you, thank, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we do we do uh, ganglion cell uh, analysis for all of uh, our patients nowadays. But as I said, uh, I mean in the in the old software. So those of you who uh, who have old software, um, like some of the machines won't have the ganglion cell analysis. But you can ask the company to to update the software for you. Thank you. 
Okay, any other questions? Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum, sir. Uh, nice presentation. I have heard you even in Pakistan. I'm from Pakistan. I have heard you in Karachi as well. So nice to see you again. Thank uh, you. Very much. Yeah, I, I think I, I give uh, a talk in, in Karachi. Karachi. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Karachi. Excellent presentation. I want to ask two questions. First, most of the times we get this uh, report, and these are done by the technicians. So the main problem what we get is the circle of the optic nerve head is not centralized. So we get report of these mostly in the myopic patients. So what to do for that? First, second question: In the myopic and highly tinted eyes, should we rely more on ganglionic cell complex or RNFL one, or they both are equal? Should we both have equal representations for the diagnosis of glaucoma? Thank you, sir. Right, for you. So for the first question, uh, as I said, the OCT scan tends to fail us. In uh, can you still see my screen? Yes, yes, yes okay. okay, that's great. So, so as I said, uh, the OCT scan uh, tend to fail us in tilted disc and uh, myopic patients. However, I don't disregard them completely. Uh, uh, I use them mainly for follow-up. So, so as, a, as a diagnostic tool, it's not very helpful in tilted disc, and, and especially when, when there is a lot of uh, corneoretinal degeneration around the optic nerve head. Uh, so the, the machine might mistake this as uh, thinning of the RNFL. So it is, it is very important uh, to distinguish between thinning of the RNFL due to high myopia and thinning of RNFL due to glaucoma. However, you can still use uh, the OCT for follow-up in myopic patients. That's the first question. Can you repeat the second question, Dr. Haller? He is not more with us, so... Sorry, sorry. I, I didn't catch the second question. Uh, it was about the optic nerve head and the RNFL, but I didn't really catch the question. We will move to the, the last question for Dr. Yes, Dr. Raka. Dr. Raka. Dr. Raka, you are with us? Yes, hello. Hi. I'm with you. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Can, you, can hear you? Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. And uh, I'm joining from Sri Lanka. You're welcome. And uh, uh, my question is uh, now, is there a standard acceptable amount of nerve fiber uh, thickness loss? for a particular period now, just as we are following up patients with the visual field tests, is it possible to follow up with the uh, OCT uh, RNFL thickness uh, like that? So do you mean follow up with, with OCT only? Can you stay with me please, don't, don't, don't mute yourself. Uh, do you yeah, mean... uh, without going for a program uh, progression analysis software, is it possible for us to compare few uh, uh, OCT reports and decide on uh, the pro progression. In such a case, how much of uh, how much of uh, nerve fiber layer thickness loss is acceptable uh, for a certain period? Is there a standard uh, thicknesses like that? All right, that's that's a very good question. Let me, let me just put a clear one. Okay, so. Uh, uh, as I said, OCT is used as uh, an adjunct to, uh, to clinical picture and to uh, visual field. So uh, in our practice, we repeat the visual field uh, once and, uh, and the OCT scan uh, every visit, because it's a, it's a quick non-invasive scan and this is, doesn't depend on the patient. So it takes about five minutes. So we, we repeat the OCT scan uh, each visit uh, and uh, we do the visual field uh, every year. Uh, and we correlate this to the clinical uh, picture and of course to uh, yeah, to the rest of, of the clinical picture. Now, for, for your question uh, about uh, what's, what's acceptable, there's something called green disease, and I will discuss this later on, inshallah. So if, if, if uh, a patient is here, can you see the screen? Yes, we can see. Okay. okay, so if the patient is here and he loses some 
uh, RNFL or there is thinning of RNFL, and he's, he the RNFL is here. That's called green uh, disease or green sign. Uh, so oh. it is important. It is important uh, to uh, look at the average RNFL thinning. Uh, so he, yeah. the, everything can still be uh, green here. Okay, but, but the patient is, right. lo is losing RNFL. So once you notice that the patient is losing RNFL and it is matching with your, uh, with your clinical examination, then you should start mm -hmm. the treatment. Okay, so how many, how many, uh, how many uh, old CT reports have to be analyzed before? Besides, Dr. Franka, sorry, the voice is interrupted. Yeah, I get, I get, I get the, question. I, I get the question. So, uh, I mean, if you have even a single OCT with with thinning, then yeah. you can you can start the treatment straight away. If the OCT is normal, but you still you still can see thinning, uh, and there is uh, let's say slight thinning of five micron or ten micron. Uh, that can be just fluctuation, but it fits with the clinical picture, like a patient with 38 IOP, for example, with positive family history and narrow angle, you know, so, so it, it's, 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 a, it's the full package, really. Right. 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 Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Walid, for this nice presentations and uh, the questions. Thank you very much for having me. I wish you will uh, join us again next week, inshallah. 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 And stay safe. Please stay safe, okay? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, all colleague, I would like, and also all of us, we have to welcome our dear prof, Ustaz Yana Shakhsiyan, Ustaz Nakudlina, Ustaz Dr. Dr. Magdi Musa. Uh, he is uh, a pharmacy consultant. He, please, Please pay attention, put your seat belt well, because Dr. Magdi Musa will take us in a very nice flight to his kingdom. Dr. Magdi, Mike with you now. Welcome, dear Rof. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for the kind invitation. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you very well. Can you see my screen? Uh, you can share. Let's see it now. Can you see it now? Still? You can see your camera, but you can, we can't see the screen yet. Uh, share the screen from... I did share the screen. Let me go again and do share screen. Share. You yes. see it now? Yes, now you see your desktop. The whole thing is desktop. Okay. Uh, the presentation is there. Now we can see the presentation. Okay, let me first thank Dr. Mohammed Taufi for the kind invitation. And I see a lot of audience, over 500 down there. I enjoyed the talk of Dr. Walid, Dr. Mustafa, Dr. Uh, Walid again, and Dr. Wael and Dr. Walid. I have been there for three hours listening and knowing the buttons down there because it's the second time for me on the Zoom. But a lot of buttons down there, and I keep playing with them until I came to my presentation. Thanks for the invitation. And let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Magdi Moussa. I'm from Egypt, Panta University. I'm the chairman of the department. My specialty is medical retina and imaging. Today, my talk is about OCT in real life practice. Do we need OCTA in everything? Let's go through the presentation. I have no financial disclosure because I'm going to speak about the machine I have the good experience in, which is the Topcon machine, though I don't have any financial disclosure. I have the machine since almost five years in September 2015. Let's go for a quick introduction to optical coherence tomography and geography. We all know that it's a technology, a new one, depending on measuring the movement inside the blood vessels of the erythrocyte inside the eye. So it's multiple line scans on the same point, getting any movement inside the eye. We all know that the only thing is moving is the RBCs inside the blood vessels. So it allows non-invasive visualization of the retinal choroidal vessels by detecting the erythrocyte mode. The picture on the right side, as you see, it's a depth resolved imaging modality. You can see multiple levels, though the machine will segment that in one by one level, but sometimes can get a movie 
having all the layers and you can subtract layer by layer and I think it will be in the future. By this, it will enable us to visualize three-dimensional retinal and choroidal musculature. And this is the output of the machine. We get a line scan like this with all the layers and I will show you one by one how the layers work. This is the first layer which is the superficial capillary plexus which is bordered by the internal limiting membrane including the retinal fiber layer and ganglion layer. So it's up to the inner plexiform layer. Then comes to the second layer, which is the deep capillary plexus, which is bordered by the inner plexiform to the outer plexiform layer. And each layer has a color code surrounding the uh, cube, as we can see here. The next layer is the outer retina. We know there is no vessels in the outer retina, so it gets black. And sometimes you see white dots like this because of the uh, showing the chorea capillaries through the effect of the RP. And it's light blue. And the last one is the dark blue, which is the chorea capillaris layer, which is limited by Brooks membrane and the chorea capillaris. So these are the four color coded areas, which the machine segment automatically and put it in the output. And we can even print it. And we can see the orange, the green, the light blue, and the dark blue. Four layers. And this is like false color code, which uh, putting all the layers together so we can see we can see the orange with the superficial plexus, the green is the deep plexus, and the core capillaries in the blue. And this is the output as we can see. This is the output the machine can give you, superficial plexus, as we see on the left side here. This is the first one. The deep plexus, which is completely different to superficial plexus, I can explain that in a minute. The superficial plexus looks like the plexus we see on Plusia and Geography, where the vessels is coming straight lines, then branching, and then making the surrounding capillaries of the fovular vasculature. The deep plexus, we don't see it on Plusia and Geography. It looks like vortex or, a, 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 or like a head, medusa head, and then coming branching for it. So it's not exactly like the superficial plexus, it's completely different. And look at this, this is the superficial plexus inside the retinal fiber and ganglion cell layer. If I click on this, and this is the density map, we can see the flow inside this area. If I click here on the deep plexus, it will come the flow inside the deep area, the deep plexus, and we can see it is like accumulation of vessels connected horizontally and vertically. Let's go to the lecture. OCT in real life practice. We all know that a lot of places had OCT now, but not all of us have it. When should I order OCT? Should I order OCT in every retinal vascular disorders like artery occlusion, vein occlusion, diabetic retinopathy? Can OCT add in the diagnosis of management of CMV? We know that OCT is used nowadays a lot in CMV diagnosis, not in the management, but in the diagnosis. Is there any situation that OCT would be preferred or superior than leucine and geography and OCT? And can OCT be the only diagnostic tool in certain macular disorders? We will answer these questions at the end of the lecture. In diabetic retinopathy, we all know that baseline we do fluorescein and OCT, which is quite good enough for diagnosis and management of diabetic retinopathy. But can OCT detect changes we don't see by either fluorescein or by microscope or OCT? This is a patient, female, with diabetic retinopathy and her visual active 612. And look at the horizontal line scan. We don't see much of changes, maybe subtle changes in the peripopular area like hard exudates or hyperplectoposite, but there is no gross lesion over there to explain the 612 vision. So the OCTA is the clue in this case. There is ischemic macula, though we used to teach the undergraduate that the first changes are microaneurysm, fluid, exudation, and then comes the occlusion and enlargement of the face. On the contrary, sometimes you get the earliest change is ischemia. And let me magnify that. This is the superficial plexus, and this is the density map. You can see how much enlarged the face because of the low flow in the peripheral area, or we can say capillary dropout. So probably this is the cause of diminution of vision in this case. So again, we can explain why the vision is affected instead of going and not believing the patient or doing further investigation. Proliferative diabetic retinopathy, fluorescein angiography and OCT is quite good enough. We can see here, this is a proliferative case with multiple NVEs. We can see here an NVE and the along the arcades and diffuse macular edema, and it's proved to be cystoid by the OCT. 
But why the vision is markedly impaired? The vision is dropped to 660. Now, I can use OCTA in such cases to prove what is going on in there. So look at the superficial plexus. This is a three by three millimeter cube, highlighting the central phobia and the surrounding area, which is a three by three millimeter. And we can see how much ischemia at the level of the superficial plexus and much more ischemia at the level of the plexus. How about knowing the difference between the cyst, as we see in the picture here, probably this is a cystoid, and this is the real ischemia. We will combine this with the onfus. So combining this with the onfus means that we can see where the cyst is, though the cyst can press on the deep plexus and causing ischemia, and where is the real ischemia is. So this can explain why the vision is markedly diminished, not because of the systolic edema alone, but also because of the ischemia, which can be clearly delineated by superficial endocrines. And this is the density map. And this is the flow. And we all know that blue means no flow, yellow less flow, and red is a very high flow. When I ordered OCTA, I had this patient, 65 years old female, coming to me with this fluorescein shock. She is very uncooperative, as the doctor did the fluorescein for her. She had media opacity, which is scattered. And she had this late phases because she had reaction at the beginning of the diet. So I can say that this is a proliferative with NVD and NVEs, but I cannot delineate how much it's in there. Repeating OCT is very beneficial, as you will see. It can penetrate through because I have this web source. So this, look at this, crystal clear where the ischemia is, where the new vascularization is, and where is the NVD and also on the right side. You can see how much extensive is in there, which was not clearly seen by the fluorescein because of the media opacity and the quality of the picture of the photos, and how we can detect everything, NVEs, NVD, areas of ischemia, and we can start treating this patient based on this. Let me go to another case. This is an interesting case with OCT in a, uh, I did OCT in a 65-year-old mean with diabetic retinopathy. But looking at the picture, this is not only a diabetic property. We have a coincident lesion, which is age-related macular degeneration. Looking at the picture, we can see here microaneurysm. We can see microaneurysm, but there are some retina pigmented feeling detachment, some drusen all over the circle, and the patient is complaining of the right eye. Let's have a better picture for this. OCT horizontal line scan, horizontal line scan showing nothing to be seen on the left eye, but look at the right eye. Typical systolic macular edema. But is that quite good enough? Looking at the OCT, we have to always interpret or go deep. Look at the retinal pigment epithelium. We can see there is systolic edema, and it is explained by the presence of diabetic macular edema due to leaking peripheral capillaries. Let me show you other multiple line scans to fulfill your satisfaction. This is through the pigmented lesion over there, which is RP hyperplasia, which we can see sometimes in long-standing age-related. Another line scan through the retinal pigmented film that which we can see here. But again, keep looking at the outer retina. Look at the elevation of the retinal pigmented film. Look at the thick choroid. Look at this flat and irregular RP detachment where the RP is separated from the Bruce membrane, which we call the double ribs. So before starting treating this patient, we have clearly to identify, is it only one pathology or it's a combined pathology? We said it's an age-related macular degeneration and it looks like a dry type. But how about the cyst? Is this state related only to diabetes or this edema related to CN2? Look at the OCT angio. OCT angio, this is, as we said, the superficial plexus. This is the deep plexus. And we can see there is ischemia. It's definite ischemia in the peripheral area, plus the cyst, which can see can be seen by the onfus. But where is the outer retina layers? Here it comes. This is the 3 by 3 cube. And if you look, this is the fluorescein shadow, by the way. Multiple are to detach, leaking peripheral capillaries. But there is some kind of hyperfluorescence inside the phobia itself which may be related to the cystoid macular edema, but look at the outer retinal layers. 
Reloading dose of anti vegetable special is treated by Ilea, and she get flat. Look at the again the RP detachment still there, but the macula is getting the right. And this is how we can judge if this CMV is active or not. There is an activity, high flow. There is no flow, and it's a filamentous or long filament-like vessels, which means that the membrane is not active. So some. Times with combined lesions, we should not miss cases like this. Let's move to the RVO. We all know that sometimes we don't do fluorescein for RVO anymore, but sometimes we need to know if this patient having ischemia in the macular area. Look at this. This patient had a small cyst with peripheral cystic changes, but the OCTA can clearly delineate that there is much more ischemia at the level of the deep plexus than the superficial plexus. And this explains why the vision is markedly impaired in this eye. Though fluorescein doesn't show much of this ischemia, but OCT is superior than this. And this is the density map. You can see the fovular vascular zone is enlarged. Multiple areas of capillary drop out, or we call it low flow. And how much enlargement of the fovial vascular zone at the level of the deep plexus, not only the superficial plexus. And it always explain why the vision sometimes in RDO is markedly affected and we don't see corresponding pathology in the fluorescein angel. What else? A patient coming with what we call impending vein occlusion. Why we call it impending? Because there is no much macular disease. It's tortuous vessels, hemorrhages, disc edema, but there is nothing to explain why the vision is 6 over 6. We used to see impending, we say, we follow up this patient, sometimes the RDO is spontaneously resolved, and this is the natural course. But why the vision here is 6 over 60? The macula is dry, foveal contour is, is there. So why the patient is not seeing well? Is it because of the congestion at the optic disc? I don't think so. Let's go to the multiple line scans, which will tell us why the patient is not seeing well. And it's clearly seen here, it's a pen, which is a paramacular acute medial maculopathy, which is ischemia at the level of the deep plexus, not hitting the superficial plexus. There is no leakage from the superficial plexus, and this is only inside to the deep plexus. And you can see it here at the level of the deep plexus, where we can see the amount of ischemia. And this is the on pass that we call it firm like, which is the leaf, hyper reflective leaf. We can see in the perifog and the parafogal area the amount of patches of ischemia. So this is what we call paramacular acute medial maculopathy, which we see clearly sometimes in diabetics, in vein occlusion, and it can explain why the vision is diminished in this case. So this is another important issue doing OCT angiography in these cases. And this is the paracentral area full of scattered ischemic patches. And this is the abbreviation of paracentral acute medial maculopathy or the PM, which isolated deep capillary ischemia, not affecting the superficial, only the deep plexus, and reside at the inner and outer border zone of the inner nuclear layer, as we can see here. So we can see the hyperreflective lines at the level of this deep plexus, like hyperreflective bands delineating the amount of ischemia, and it affects the vision and especially this, those patients come saying that we have a central scuttle. We're you following me, Dr. Mohammed. Hello? We are following you. Yes, we hear you. We hear you, Doctor. Okay. Okay. I, will, I hope I'm not going so fast. Am I? No, no, no. It's very good. Very good. Okay. Let's go to OCT and geography in CMV. We all know that there is a lot of debate saying that OCT and geography is not helpful in the periphery, but help in the macular area. And CMV happens in the macular area. So a lot of papers published about the identification of CMV by OCT and geography. OCTA give us information about the flow, as we can see here, how the membrane is active and has different patterns. It's not the time to explain that, but I will show you some, some pictures. No membranes acting give us the criteria around the activity and decision treatment can be also helpful by OCTA, especially in certain cases, which we will discuss in a minute. 
And so it can be defined by the structural code, structure, code instant structural uh, OCT, like the line scan, where the membrane is, is it subretinal, is it sub-RPE, is it inside the retina? So this is a very valuable information by OCT. To know if the OCT, uh, to know if the CMV is active or not, we have to look at the OCTA. There is increased density of these capillaries. There is anastomosis at the periphery and arborization of the membrane. All these are signs of activity, and this is the density map where the flow is very high in the main trunk and in the arborizing vessels. So these are all signs of activity, and we say looping. You can see multiple loops at the periphery connecting the peripheral vessels. They give an example of this as a blooming tree, a very fruitful tree with its leaves, the green leaves, which mean the trunk and viable leaves, meaning that this membrane is active. How about inactive after repeated injection, what the membrane will turn into? The membrane will not disappear because there must be a trunk there. There must be a source of the membrane, though sometimes OCTA doesn't show this. But we can see here that these are trunks, like dead tree, there is no leaves, there is no arborization, there is no anastomosis, and this is where we make sure that the membrane is not active anymore, and sometimes we need to follow up patient with the structural OCT and OCTA, as I will show you in a minute. Let me go, when I do OCTA in cases of CMV, not all of the cases, because fluorescein and OCT again is quite good enough, but let's go and discuss in a couple of slides what is the meaning of non-exhibitive wet MD? We used to classify MD into dry and wet, and the wet is the exhibitive because of the fluid. This is a third category called non-exhibitive wet MD. Where do we find that? It is discovered accidentally sometimes in the other part of patient with neovascular MD, like the picture in here. This is the right eye of a patient with established CMV, with cystoid macular edema, elevated retinal pigment epithelium, which is type one where the membrane is under the retinal pigment epithelium, or we call it type 1 CMV. How about the left eye? When the, this patient presented to me, I looked at the left eye and said, this is a retinal pigment epithelium detachment with a few drusen scattered at the posterior pole. Yes. And this is the retinal pigment epithelium detachment proved by the OCT. What is the meaning of silent CMV? Is there a CMV down there? Yes. Why this CMV is not giving us any manifestation? There is no hemorrhage, there is no explanation, there is no fluid in here in the structure of OCT. So the OCT is showing a very active CMV under this flat and irregular RP detachment. How come this CMV is not giving us any manifestation on the structure of OCT? A lot of theories, a lot of publications, a lot of talks in the literature about science in. Should we start treating this patient though there is no activity on the structure OCT or even on fluorescein? Should we close follow up of this patient? Based treating this patient would be depending on fluorescein, OCT or OCTA. There is a CMV down there, but it is not giving us any manifestation. Five years ago or four years ago, I used to treat this patient. And this is the patient. I gave her once antivision and nothing happened. The membrane is still the same. And I did another couple of patients and I found no change. The vision is still the same. There's no change on the OCT. There's no change on the fluorescein. And OCT is almost the same. So three years later, only follow up of this patient showing that maybe the flat and irregular RP detachment is increasing, but the membrane is still the same. There is no changes on the surface of the retina. There is no structural changes and the vision is still six points. So most of the literature now saying we should closely monitor this patient. Give you another example. A 74 years old female patient with dry MD in both eyes. We can see the drusen and we can see some RPE defect, mottling of the RPE in both eyes in the peripheral area. And when I did OCT, structural and OCTA, I found bilateral silent CMV and the patient was not complaining, except of the nuclear cataract with 612 patient. Should we treat this patient? I did follow up this patient because I had the experience, and I followed up for two years. She only dropped down 618 because of the cataract. But still, we have two silent CMV down there, and it is not affecting the vision. 
a lot of literature saying why we see this, they call it silent CMV, where the CMV is starting, or they call it different type, which we call non exhibitive wet MD, and some even of the doctors like Philip Rosenfield say it's a it's a friendly CMV, which nourishes the retinal pigment epithelium, though I am against this. I don't think there's anything friendly about CMV. But in my opinion, this is a very early stage of CMV. Because patients with CMV only present it to us when they have complaint, like visual loss, blaring of vision, metamorphopsia. But they never come without visual complaint. So it means that it could be a very early stage of CMV, and we will never know how long these patients will keep silent and when they will start leaking and give symptoms. And I have another lecture about that. But all I can tell you, this patient only discovered by OCTA, they need to be followed up closely by structural OCT and OCTA. You don't need to repeat to and geography. Any changes in the vision or metamorphopsia increasing, we have to do repeat OCT and geography and structural OCT to find out if there is a fluid, we start to inject. If there is not, we start to follow up. We keep following up. Let me go to the another part of the lecture, OCTA in pediatric age group. We all know that doing close and geography is very difficult. ICG is impossible almost to keep the child 30 minutes on the machine and structural OCT sometimes is not conclusive by its own. So this is a patient who was diagnosed already as best disease, and he had recent diminution of vision in the right eye, and he could not do his activity at school. And his mother brought him in. He had best disease doctor, and we know that since four years, and we are following him up, and he was doing good at the school, but nowadays he cannot manage. And I looked at him, yes, it's a typical best disease. And we can see the hyper vision down there, and we all know that this is not a sensory attachment. This is exactly like an empty space elevating the retina. It could be previously uh, uh, light of the position and cleared up. It could be the action due to the failure of the pump of the RPE. But I did multiple line scans from both eyes and I looked at it, why the patient is not seeing. And I looked at the boy and I examined him clearly and I said, this boy had, as I said, diminution of vision in both eyes. But when I looked at him and I examined him, I found intermittent exotropia in the left eye, which means that this eye was not the main or the dominant eye. The right eye was the dominant eye. So I looked again and I did multiple eye scans in the right eye, nothing to do with it. There is no sign of anything to explain why the boy is complaining. Until I did OCTA, and this was 2016, four years ago now, and I found a CMB down there. Again, is this a silent CMB? I don't think it's a silent. It's a CMB. But why it is not showing any changes in the retina? Because silent CMV is completely different from age-related and myopic CMV. We don't see exudation. We don't see hemorrhage. In in the complicated uh, retinal dystrophies, manifestation is completely different. It could be a, a silent, as I said, but I don't think it's a silent. It's an active CMV, and the manifestation is not the typical as we see in old age. So this is the fluorescein and OCT, and the color and fluorescein, and I looked back again. How did I miss the CMV? Look at this. The circle is surrounding the vitelliform lesion, but this is not actually the vitelliform lesion. It's the CMV inside the vitelliform lesion, surrounded by tiny hemorrhage, which I missed during interpretation. So it means there is another science we have to look carefully, because we look at the best hyperreflective material, yellowish spots, Patient is complaining, but they always complain because of the lesion encroaching on the pocket there. But this is a typical thing. How can we anticipate the complaint of the patient, looking carefully at the fluorescein OCD? And I did inject that boy, anti -pagef. And again, I repeated the <coughs> OCT, the structure, there is nothing there. You cannot tell from the structure OCT if the membrane is improving or not. And this is the multiple line scans, but look at this. This is the OCT. You can see the flow is getting less and the membrane is getting smaller and we can stop injecting this boy at this level. And fortunately, we will gain vision 6 ET. So he can read now, he can work at school and I depended only on OCT for the diagnosis. What else you should use OCT? In cases of chronic CC, where everything is destroyed, we, we call it sick RP syndrome or 
diffuse pigment etiopathy, multiple points of view. A patient has a chronic CSAR years ago and, and suffering from diminution of vision every now and then. When we look at this, we will never be able to tell if this patient is harboring CMV or not, except if we do an OCT like this. Because looking at the structure, OCT, we can see, again, flat irregular RP attachment with enlarged and dilated large choroidal visit, pushing the chorea capillaries, elevating the return pigment. But we will never thought that this patient might harbor choroidal vascular brain, and probably these are choroidal choroidal lesions in these cases. And this is the polyps at the end of the arborization. So sometimes when you face with a CSC with recent diminution of vision, and you look at the fundus, and you say, we cannot tell if the fluid is the cause or not, do OCTA because some of these patients might benefit from intravitreal injection of anti pressure to regain the vision. Another thing, if you have a patient coming complaining of blunt trauma like this, and he is 28 years old man, and he left, had left recent division of vision following blunt ocular trauma, and he's accusing the guy who gave him the trauma that he lost his vision because of that. And I looked at him, I said, there is hemorrhage, there is elevation of the macula, and I can see that there is mottling of the retin pigment epithelium, and I can see something leaking under this, which is expected to be a CMP. But would the trauma in a 48 hours doing a CMB like this, we all know trauma can cause choroidal rupture and then complicated by CMB, but this is, doesn't happen in 48 hours. So I did OCT and I found, yes, OCT and OCT prove that this patient had the CMB. Again, it's a CMB, but it is against the logic. Why CMB developed in a case like this? Look at this clearly and always remember to check the other eye because the clue might be in the other eye. When I looked at him, I said, what is this yellowish coloration? I thought it's because of the trauma, commotiorythmia, and it can be commotiorythmia. And here's the CMV, and here's the OCTA proof that we have a nice CMV down there with arborization and anastomosis. But when I looked at the, and here's again the structure line scan, and we can see the flow inside the CMV. But when I looked at the right eye, what is this? Again, there is more clinical paratypic epithelium. And I asked the patient, do you have a trauma in this eye? He said, no, only the left eye. So the patient was a malinger, he was a liar, and I looked at him and I did OCT and the clue was there. It is empty fovea, disrupted outer retinal layers, parpopial degenerative cyst, and OCTA was the clue. We have at the level of superficial plexus nothing, but at the level of the deep plexus triangiectasia, which is the cause of this RP modeling, and you can see here the perifovial tangiectasia, which is complicated by CMV, not probably related to the trauma, and the patient was accusing the guy who hit him. And getting more and more details from the patient, he said, yes, my vision is deteriorating since almost one and a half months in this eye. So again, we could save the hitter by doing OCTA. Sometimes we do OCTA to exclude, not to prove that there is a CMV. This patient was referred to me for injection. He had a CMV in the right eye, multiple leaky. Uh, sources of uh, leaking points of undetermined source in the right eye and this patient has a 61 years old and he was diagnosed as age-related metallization of wet type and he had a posterior subcapsular cataract in the right eye. Intraocular pressure was normal and the diagnosis was CMV and this is his fluorescein. I scanned it and I have it with me and I looked at the color, multicolor and the fluorescein and there is something leaking down there which starts here and then it increased intensity and a little bit in size and the lead phases of the angiogram. And I looked at him and I said, should I start injecting him? No. Let me look at his OCT. And I did OCT and I found this. And this can be easily mistaken for CMV because it's a subretinal material with thickening, minimal thickening in the center of the macula. So it could be a CMV. But in the differential diagnosis, and I can listen to you, a lot of you, of you saying now, it's a best disease. Yes. So I did fundus autofluorescence, and yes, it's a breast disease. But again, can you exclude CMV? It could be an early CMV down there. So I did OCTA, and I found nothing at the level of the outer retina or the chorea capillaries, which can exclude CMV and say this patient doesn't have a CMV. So again, I did OCTA to tell the patient that you don't have, because the patient telling you the truth was already injected twice in this eye, and the doctor wanted to continue, and the patient said, I'm not improving. 
The patient went back again to another doctor and we kept injecting him and he put aside the OCTA, this was four years ago, and he kept injecting him until he developed a macular cord. A return membrane with attraction for the repeated injection and he developed a macular cord. So we shouldn't inject patients for vein. Nothing can regain the vision here and we have to diagnose CMV properly before start treating the patient because there is a medical legal problem in these cases. In high myopia, we all know that it's very difficult sometimes to say if this myopic patient has a CMV or not because again the myopic CMV sometimes comes with a minimal fluid or minimal changes at the level of the outer retina. This is the left eye of a penile patient with a CMV in the left eye, long standing CMV, and fluorescein angiography of the right eye showing a small, tiny lesion in the center of the forehead. And the patient is complaining of central scotoma, not metamorphosis. When I looked at him, is that a typical CMV? I did OCT and it was not conclusive because we all know it could be a scar, it could be an old one, multiple lines cast and minimal fluid. I cannot say there's much fluid in there, but look at the OCT, it's conclusive. It is a CMV. And we should start treating this patient based on this. Use the CMV with a high flow. It's not typical like arthritization of this because we have different pattern of high myopia and we can see the flow inside the CMV. Another patient coming with a foveal hemorrhage and she's a female, 27 years old. She's a doctor, a resident in our hospital and she's complaining of less left diminution of vision with paracentral scotoma, high myopia, minus eight, 2060 vision. And we can see here the hemorrhage here and elevation due to the hemorrhage. Should I start treating this patient? I did OCTA and I found that the, OC, the CMV is in different situation. It is not below the hemorrhage, it's at the edge of the hemorrhage where the CMV is there. Very tiny CMV, starting CMV, and we started to treat this patient after treatment, the CMV is getting less and less, and only two injection of Avastin, she regained 612 vision. Let me give you a couple of cases. I still have time, I know. A couple of cases, and I will stop and let you think, and then we can answer the question together. Sometimes, OCTA can be the only clue for diagnosis of this patient. Here's an A patient, aged 55 years, Old, he's hypertensive, under control, he has white, recent glaring vision, one month period, and his visual act is 624. Fluorescein geography, I see nothing. Everything is intact, the disc is fine, the vessels is filled, and the uh, arterial venous timer is fine, and the vision in the left eye is 6 over 6. Why the patient is complaining? This is the left eye, by the way. Let me give you a bigger picture. Here's the patient, and I did OCT, and I looked at it. Look at this, and tell me, what do you see in this OCT? I'm pointing to some hyperreflective area in there. Another line scan, you can see a hyperreflective band at the level of the deep plexus, which means the, this patient had insult at the level of the deep plexus. What kind of insult? He doesn't have diabetes, he doesn't have is controlled hypertension. Why is he showing this? Another line scan, multiple areas of infarct at the level of the deep plexus. Let me give you another line scan. All the line scans showing this. So it means that he had infarct all over the peripheral area. And I'm magnifying the color fungus. What do you see in this color fungus? Look at this. What are these? yellow spots. These are showers. This patient had a carotid ataroma with calcification and these are showers from the carotid. So it means that this small emboli left the superficial plexus and went deep to occlude the periphobial or the paraphobial deep capillary plexus and this is the cause of diminution of vision. It's a long standing and he already had showers before and he told me that he had some kind of brain stroke, but he not had any residual manifestation. And I, when I did the carotid, I was astonished that he had a large ataroma with calcification. So instead of doing further and further investigation, 
or telling the patient we don't trust your complaint, we can find out why this patient is suffering. And this is the OCTA. Look at the OCTA. We don't see exactly what we see by the acute phase of pain or para macular acute medial maculopathy, but we can see this is at the level of the superficial plexus, which is intact, but look at the level of the deep plexus. Enlarge it has, which means that most of the insult is at the level of the deep plexus, and this is why the patient is complaining of scotoma. Central scotoma, and he's not happy with his vision because he already had infarction at the level of the deep plexus, and it's a long stem and ongoing process. Here's another case, the, the one before the last one, the male patient, 40 years old. I'm giving you the fluorescein. What do you see in the fluorescein? Let me help you out. You can see areas of capillary drop out. Probably these are infarcts. And this patient had a recent attack of hypertension, shooting of blood pressure, and 180 over 120. He's not diabetic. He had some kind of renal function impairment and he's complaining of right marked initial vision with a visual active 660 and the left eye is 6 mile. Let me show you the color thunder page. What do you expect in the color thunder page? Soft exudates, yes. He had multiple soft exudates in the very peripheral area. But nothing is seen in the central area but fluorescence. Why we are not seeing anything? Because the superficial plexus again is intact. And we cannot delineate what is going on in the central area, except if we do multiple line scans again. So this is infarction again at the level of the deep plexus. And there is infarction at the level of superficial plexus, which is the soft exudates or the micro occlusion of the lateral nerve fiber near capillaries. This is another oblique line scan showing the hyperreflective bands in here. And this is an oblique line scan passing through one of the superficial infarcts or the soft exudates and passing through one of the deep infarcts, which is the infarction at the level of the deep plexus. So this is a combined microinfarction at the level of superficial and deep plexus. And this three by three millimeter cube, look at this. Superficial plexus, yes, there is kind of skinny enlargement of the face, but most of the insult is at the level of the deep plexus. Most of the infarction is at the level of the deep plexus in the peripoveal area, and this is the cause of the motion of patient. We never thought about this when we had only fluorescein and geography and OCT, and the old OCT, which was not high resolution, we could not get all these changes. But nowadays, this is another bigger picture, millimeter, and you can see here, superficial plexus is fine except of this area, but the deep plexus is markedly insulted with multiple areas of infarction, and the amphans can see the whitish patches, which means marked peripoveal capillary occlusion at the level of the deep plexus. And let me give you a wider field showing the superficial and the deep insult. The superficial insult obstructing the flow or not, not or hiding the flow inside the superficial plexus, but this is not seen here, this is the deep plexus, and we can see how much ischemia or insult at the level of the deep plexus compared with the superficial plexus. And this is another explanation that this patient had marked drop of vision, and we have to put this in consideration when we have patients with a shooting blood pressure or malignant hypertension complaining, and we don't see anything related to fluorescein angiography or structural OCT. We have to look at the OCTA to find out what's going on. And this patient had a renal retinopathy on his under children. My last case, this is a female patient. She's a doctor, and I used to see her 16 years ago when she was young, and she had best disease. I know, and I've seen her since she was uh, almost 16 or 17 years old. She had right recent glaring of vision, and her left eye had old macular scar, as we see, and visual active 0.8 in the right eye, which is not bad, and 560 in the left eye, an eccentric fixation. Why I'm saying she's having a, a scar in the left eye? Because this is the picture in 2003, 17 years ago. She had developed a CMV on top of best disease, and I didn't do anything for her until she... Why didn't I do anything for her? Why didn't I inject her? Remember this? 2003. There was no intravitreal injection at that time. 
So we used to follow up this patient till the actual history happens and they lose their vision. And that's why she's coming quickly with the right eye. She said, I'm not happy, I'm not seeing well. And I respected her complaint and I did OCT. I could find nothing. And I told her, I don't see anything. It's 0.8 vision, she's 6'9 almost, and nothing in the structure OCT or the fluid explaining why. And I can see there is a staining of the vitelliform lesion and nothing in the structure OCT. So she said, I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied with this vision because I used to see better. And I returned to her file. She missed follow up for five years, but the last five years, five years ago, she had 0.8, the same vision, but the quality is not that good. I did OCT and I looked at this. I said, is that a silent CD? Or this is an early thing? I didn't know. But it looks like something is in there, inside the vitil deformation. So I couldn't explain why she had blurring vision, though there's no fluid, there is nothing in there. And I told her, doctor, please give me a couple of weeks and pass by again. She said, I'm not happy with the vision. I said, I cannot start treating anything right now. But I have in mind that this could be a silent CMD. It could be an early, very early stage because it's like a small active fibrovascular form inside the CMD. And this is a very early catch in this eye. Two weeks later, not three weeks, two weeks later, she came in with typical manifestation of CMD. Fluid, elevation, and diffuse macular pain. And look at this. The membrane is getting huge in a couple of weeks only. The vision dropped down to 0.6. And she said, didn't I tell you, I'm not getting better, I'm getting worse. And I repeated that and I told her, now I can start treating because this is an active symptom. And she said, would my patient be back? I said, I don't know, but I injected her. And this is after repeated IV injection. And look at this. It's crystal clear that the fluid is gone. The patient regained 6-6 six, six vision, not six, even 0.8. Six, six vision. I don't know how, but she was happy. She was satisfied and she told me all the blaring symptoms is coming. So sometimes we have to catch this patient in a very early stage. And I told you sometimes this patient do not manifest with the typical picture of CMV. They don't get hemorrhage much. They don't get exudation much. Only they start to have metamorphosis or blurring vision because minimal fluid sometimes can affect the visual active, especially if the patient is intelligent as this doctor. So this is pre and post injection, and I was glad that the patient regained six, six vision. I'm still following her up for six months now. There is no recurrence after now, and she is coming every couple of months, not one month after that. So it's a very good point to catch a patient at an early stage and to prove it by OCTA. So my take home message is OCTA is becoming an important tool in real life practice, as we have seen in many cases I presented. And it's crucial in many retinal vascular disorders when fluorescein and jogger and OCT are not conclusive, as we have seen, especially in children. And it's the only capable imaging modality of revealing quiescent or silent or non exudative CMD. We have to suspect these patients in the other eye of CMD, or sometimes they come out of the blue sky without anything except flat and irregular RP detachment. In any case like this, we should do OCTA and can be the only clue in cases of macular dystrophy complicated by CMD. And the best method of follow-up of this patient after repeated intravitreal injection, not only structural OCT, we have to combine structural OCT with OCTA to make sure that the membrane is gone because structural OCT sometimes is deceive, deceiving you and not telling you the whole, the whole story. And OCTA can also exclude CMD in certain condition instead of injecting the patient of best or other form of teleport for vein and getting complications from repeated injection so we can avoid that. And thank you so much for your listening. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, much. Thank you for this nice presentation. Thank you, thank you. I hope I'm on time. I think I'm on time, right? Thank you, Dr. Magdi. We are more than happy because we are so enjoying with your presentation. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Fawaz, want to talk with you, sir? Okay. Uh, Good evening, uh, Dr. Majdi, and mm -hmm. thank you again for your... Kifak Fawaz, let's talk about Kifak Fawaz. Kifak Fawaz. First of all, we met in Amman, in Amman Retina Meeting, but of course, we'll be able to meet you again. I'm also happy to meet you again, but I'm happy to meet you again. 
Let's turn back, yes. back to Andy. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. And again, you highlight in your presentation the importance of OCTA in, uh, in assessing the diabetic macular edema, especially the ischemic element. And this is very important if you want to protect the vision of our patients if we start to initiate the anti-vigil treatment. And yeah. also in, in wet AMD, especially in cases of uh, subretinal hyperreflective material, because sometimes we need to know whether these uh, subretinal hyperreflective material are just a vitelliform lesion or as active CMV. And as you show uh, to us in the flat or shallow RP detachment, because sometimes uh, these shallow RP detachments may hide a silent CMV, and as I remembered uh, four years ago when we gave the presentation about the OCTA, I think you and also me, we were treat those yes. cases. But, but yes. now the silent CMV, there's no need for treatment because they need a long time to develop an active CMV. And when you treat them, you may induce a geographic atrophy. Just rapidly, my question to you, which type of a scan you prefer uh, when you uh, use the OCTA NGO? Is it three by three, four by four? And when you need to follow up the patient, uh, do you, use, you should use uh, the same scan or a different scan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Fawaz, for the asking and thank you for the compliment. I, I, I always use 3x3 because it's highest resolution, especially in the macular area. Sometimes I go to 4x4 or 6x6. If I find the lesion, I cannot get by 3x3, though 3x3 is almost quite good enough, especially in CMV cases and BAM and all these cases. But sometimes you need a bigger review if you are detecting like a patient with the PAM, I need it to see if the insult is only in the parafocal area, no, it's extending up to the disc. So again, I use three by three. I always do multiple line scans. You shouldn't count on only one line scan. As you said, multiple line scans is very important because sometimes you can miss the PAM by doing only vertical, only horizontal, and the insult is not in this line. So multiple line scans is very important. Three by three to start with, and you can enlarge that. And I always start by three by three because you all know, you know that because you have the machine, you know that the three by three is the best in all machines. You should start by the highest resolution to get the fine details in the back area. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for the question. Uh, we can take a question, Dr. Magdi, please. We have a question from Dr. Mohsin Iqbal again. Yes. Mohsin. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Very nice Alaykum salam. Professor. Excellent. We have seen very much deep insight to view of the OCT angiography. I wanted to ask that how can we distinguish between uh, active CNV and uh, silent CNV in OCT angiography? That's a very good one. Uh, active or silent? As, as I said, this is a contradictory. When I said it's inactive, I said there is a long filament, there is no arborization, no anastomosis. Sometimes you look at this and you find it the same way and we can still say it's a non exhibitor Why? Once you found any new vascular front at the level of the outer retina or the core capillaries, it's a CMV. Because this area, we all know, it's devoid of vessels. So once we find this, it's a CMV. So if you have no manifestation in the overlying retina by structural OCT, like fluid, like excretion, like edema, like fist, it's a silent CMV. It's a CMV down there, but there is no exudation in the retina. So it's a silent CMV. And as I said, sometimes there is a very small line in between. You find early fluid. Is this because of the CMV is getting active or not? This is why I depend on both structural and OCTA. Structural will show you minimal fluid, but OCTA sometimes would show that the membrane is progressing and the flow is getting higher and increasing in size. OCTA and it's not reflecting what's on the structures. So it's easier to catch the progression of this silence in the by OCTA better than the structures. Dr. Magdi, what about follow ups, sir? Should follow up, when, when should they follow up? Yes, both of them, structural and OCTA. You should never repeat the structure of Because sometimes I have a complete lecture on this and I was going to give this in a man when Dr. Thomas mentioned about silence in the what you need to know about. So sometimes you do the structure, you find no fluid. But you look at the OCTA, the size is increasing, the flow is increasing. In a couple of weeks, you will find the manifestation in the structure OCT with fluid and hemorrhage sometimes. So once we detect progression of this silent CMV, we will start treating and don't forget the vision. 
these patients are always intelligent because they lost most of the uh, these patients the other eye. So once they have blurring of vision, quality is getting down, no much flow to explain that, and OCT is showing the progression, you should start to take those patients. Dr. Magdi, may I ask a question, please? Yes, Muhammad Habib. Uh, 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 my question is about uh, if you have an CNEV already, we are uh, treating them. You depend on structural OCT or in OCT and geography on follow up of this patient. Uh, specific, uh, specifying the question if you have in structural OCT no subretinal fluid and we found the membrane, but with there is no subretinal fluid or intraretinal fluid. And we have an OCTA, and the OCTA have a clue of activity. You complete inject, you uh, 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 re-inject this patient, or keeping follow up of this patient until the structural OCT regain collecting the fluid, either subretinal or intraretinal. That's a tricky and hard question. Okay, we all always depend on OCT in treating CMV, right? because we have to find signs of activity on OCT structure OCT. Yes. We have to have fluids, and we have to differentiate between subretinal fluid, intraretinal fluid, and sub-RT fluid. So again, the standard is the structure OCT. Yes. If we have residual intraretinal fluid, we should keep treating. Even on OCTA, there is complete regression. But I don't think if you do a very good OCTA, you will find a complete regression. You will find the flow in the OCTA. But again, depend, and this is a message for all of us, depend on the structural OCT because this is the only solid imaging modality we have, and we know about it, everything. we know about all the changes. So make sure that the intraretinal fluid is gone, subretinal fluid is an issue, because sometimes we can leave subretinal fluid because of the fluid study. But again, the regaining of the foveal contour, the maximum visual we can get like 612 in the last couple of injection, and the patient is not improving, Minimal subretinal fluid can be left there, but enter the fluid, we should not. Sub RP fluid, we are not aiming to try it. So, almost always depend on the structure OCT. And don't go to the luxury of OCT because it will be costly for the patient. Sometimes it's artifact, sometimes it's not giving you the whole, the whole picture. Right. So, uh, structure OCT is the main thing. Uh, 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 as you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Magdi, as you know, in diabetic patient, uh, we, when we inject the patient, we follow up the visual acuity and the structural OCT. Do you agree right. with me that in CNV, uh, whatever, if there is no gain in visual acuity, we inject w once there is activity? It depends on your regimen. Let's go back again. This is a very good question. It depends on your regimen. If you are treating, treat and extend. Hmm. This is an issue. If you are treating PRN, this is another issue. For instance, if you are treating treat and extend, and after the three loading dose, you get dry macula, vision is 6-9, six, 6-6. Six, six. Let's say maximum vision. 6-6, yes. six, six, dry macula, and the patient is dry after three injections. Hmm. If you are treating treat and extend, you should inject and extend to six weeks. If the patient comes back in six weeks, 6-6 six, six vision, dry macula, you will inject and come in 12 weeks. So this is the regimen. But if you are depending on PRN, after the third injection, there is no fluid, everything is dry, maximum visual gain, you should stop injection and do OCT after a month. So Perfect. Dr. Dr. In my opinion, I used to do PRN, but nowadays, treat and extend, I think, is the best. Because if you wait for the patient to come with fluid, sometimes we come very aggressively with many. I agree with you. I do a treat and extend in CNV and PRN in diabetic macular edema. That's it. That's the best regimen. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Magdi. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Majdi, how are you? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Who are you? Dr. Amin. Uh, Dr. Amin Mara. Uh, Dr. Hi, Dr. Amin how are you, Dr. Amin? We haven't met in person, but I've seen a lot of your presentations on the on the net, and I wish we had met in Abu Dhabi and in Dubai a couple of months ago, but unfortunately, you couldn't make it. Uh, due to visa issue, but my question here: the internet was uh, cutting uh, off uh, while I'm, uh, while you were talking about uh, OCT and geography for uh, cotton wool spots. Uh, I didn't hear you well. Is the infraction on the level of the capillary plexus or in the super uh, superficial uh, capillary no, plexus? No, the cotton wool spots is the superficial plexus, definitely. Oh, okay, okay, because because due to the bad connection, I heard that the uh, infection on the deep uh, plexus. That's why I, I no, it's a, the superficial plexus, and sometimes it's combined with the deep plexus. Again yes, about yes. that, uh, uh, Doctor Amr Mahfouz. 
Okay, thank you very much. That's mean that was a problem with connection. Hmm. Tofi, we are behind the time. Okay, <laughs> still have you stop. have a stop, plus, okay. Uh, Dr. Mendy, may we ask you to stay with us for the next session? Uh, we have a very quick session that we need you. I'm, I'm, I'm staying. It's the longest period I've stayed on my chair. Okay, I'm staying. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for the audience. I can see hundreds of there are still there, and I'm sure that the panel discussion will be very fruitful. I'm interested to hear the other colleagues' opinion. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Magdi, for your participation and for your very informative lectures. Uh, now I would like to uh, ask our uh, panelists to join us for the written sessions. But before that, I want in the, we are in the era of uh, COVID-19. Uh, while we're preparing for this session now, I just want you to listen to this very nice music. It's uh, done by Dr. Omar Ahmed Abdurrahman. I really like it, and I want you to, to listen for it just for one minute, just to refresh me. I hope you like it also. Now let's go back again. Uh, thank you very much, Sir Muhammad. Thank you very much. You hear me? Yes, yes I can hear you, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Omar is so happy with the, the presentation uh, that we have presented his music. Thank you. But Omar is not a doctor. Omar is a sound engineer and he's playing by. So that, and I think uh, for every music you want to produce, I will send this uh, to you immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, now our panelists, Dr. Amin, Dr. Farid, please unmute yourself, and Dr. Malgi with us, Dr. Ahmed Tawfi. Okay, Mustafa, you are with me, Mustafa? Okay, I'm Ahmed with you. Okay, so we will start. Uh, you can see the screen now, right? Yes. 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 It's so clear. Uh -huh. Just want to. Just a minute. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry because we have uh, so long time in this meeting. Um, I hope it will be uh, informative for all. All of us. Now we will start quickly a panel session about retina. We will discuss a very important topic today, which is the management of chronic persistent diabetic macular edema. Actually, it's a new term. I just know about it within the last few months. About and uh, let's go through this case presentation. 
Okay, so it's six, uh, 62 years old man. He's a diabetic for a long time. HPA1C is 9.3. Presented right eye 624, that was one. And the left eye was 618, uh, and the OB was 19. So it's from the contest picture, you can see there is an product of diabetic retinopathy with diffused macular edema. OCT, structural OCT are done for him. This is for the right eye, as you show. We have the central focal thickness of uh, 597, and the left eye is about 609. So uh, for, uh, we have uh, uh, from the structure BSB scan, we have diffuse macular edema with some exudate present here. So I decide to go for a monthly injection of Abastin. And we start, this is the baseline injection, okay, and we, I inject him on a monthly basis after three months. This is the way we go for the right eye. This was 597, then go for 572. After six months, and the, for the right eye was 526. However, on the left eye, it was 6, 609, then become 522, then become 434. Now, now uh, the six month was gone. This is what I have now. This patient is uh, from 624. After six months of monthly injection of Abastin, he gave just 618. The IOB is 23. However, on the right the left eye, it was 618, and now he gave 612 with improvement in the central foveal thickness. This is the baseline, and this, this is after five months. So I know I won't just want to differentiate and just not when, what was meaning by persistent diabetic macular edema, or this is a chronic persistent diabetic macular edema. Can you, Mustafa, tell us? Okay, I'm with you. Thank you very much, Miss. Uh, I think it's a very common scenario, very common in our practice. We see a uh, patient with the diffuse diabetic macular edema, and we decide to inject antibiotics. And the other injection, there is no response or uh, mild response. We don't reach the, dry, the point of a dry macula. You know, Do we, uh, we can't reach the point of a dry macula. I face these cases uh, commonly in my practice. So this is a very common, uh, a common scenario and good case for discussion. Uh, in this case, uh, when we prepare uh, for lecture, actually we I review uh, many papers uh, and uh, I surprising there is appendix and many informations about uh, this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, one of the information uh, mentioned in the post hoc analysis of protocol I, there's a two definition in the post hoc analysis of protocol I. I found two definitions, the definition of a persistent diabetic macular edema and then the other definition of a chronic persistent diabetic macular edema. So in this case, the response, if we have a response and we reach the macular thickness less than 250, we reach to the dry market, okay? After 24 weeks, this is uh, normal. This is uh, a good. If we don't reach the 250, we have still a macular edema, but we have a response, but still there is a macular edema, okay? But not reach 250 micrometer in the central macular thickness. This is persistent macular edema. So, what is the difference between persistent macular edema and chronic persistent macular edema? The chronic persistent macular edema, Mohammed, is uh, we have a response 10% from the baseline thickness of chronic macular thickness, okay? So, if we have a response of uh, uh, 10 percent of the baseline thickness, uh, th there's a reduction in central macular thickness by 10 percent. Now we have a case of chronic persistent macular edema, but it's, we don't reach the dry macula. Okay, if we have a response uh, uh, more than uh, 10 percent, okay, now we can. Uh, Call this case, it is a, a case of persistent macular edema. So we can go uh, back to our case. The right eye, right eye, we can uh, call the right eye as a persistent macular, uh, chronic persistent macular edema. As we see, after 24 weeks, the central macular thickness is not uh, decreased by uh, 10%. So in the right eye, there is a chronic persistent macular edema. In the left eye, there is a response. The macular edema in the baseline, 600. And then we reach to the 400. So it is a response, more than 10%. There is a reduction, more than 10% in the central macular thickness. So we have response. 
okay? But not reach the dry macula. This is called, by definition, by definition, this is called a resistant macula edema. These two definitions uh, mentioned in the post hoc analysis of uh, protocol I, okay, Ahmed, with you? Yes, okay, with me, Ahmed, okay? Yes. Okay. So, now, in your practice, Mustafa, do you switch after three injection or five injection? Let's put a pool. Well, actually, this is dependent on the patient. If it is complements and uh, it is a uh, nagging patient, I will shift for the, after the injection. But actually, actually, the guideline and the post hoc analysis, according to post hoc analysis of protocol I and post hoc analysis of protocol B, the shift should be after 24 weeks. After 24 weeks, if we have no prediction uh, by two percent, so we can think for uh, switch to the other anti-VG or switch to the steroid. What is the the opinion of audience? Uh, can, uh, can I add a comment? May I, may I give the suggestion, please? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, can I speak? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. 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 Uh, in my opinion, uh, to start the switching with the treatment, uh, for me, usually I start with the loading dose. After the three loading doses, I assess the response of, the, of my patient. If the patient didn't get any improvement in vision, for example, more the improvements less than five letters, the morphology of the edema is not improved. And at this point, I may think I suggest to switch to another kind of, of anti-digit. Uh, most of our patients, and I'm working in the private sector, they will not waiting uh, five or even six injections in order to uh, to, uh, to be shifted. Uh, so usually when I start, uh, let's, let's say, with a high end of anti vigif like a flibercept, after three loading doses, if I didn't find a very good response, I will immediately uh, thinking to shift to another arm of treatment, like the intravitreal steroid implants. But if I started with another kind of anti vigif like for example, Avastin or the Rambizumab, and after three loading doses, I didn't get a very good response. I may think to shift to another kind of anti-VGF, like the aflibercept. I will give a couple of injections, and then I wait and see the response. And there's many studies talking about uh, even when you uh, shift your patients for this to the steroid arm very early, you may get a very good visual outcome because long-standing edema. Uh, more effect on the photoreceptors, more pressure on the photoreceptors, and this uh, will be not good uh, on the final visual outcome. Thank you very much. Yeah, the Thank you very much, Doctor. I agree with you. I agree with you. This is uh, according to the patient. Yes, as I said, uh, this, uh, dependent on the and uh, also dependent on the response. Okay. Uh, Who can I add no, a comment? No, okay. Uh, uh, just, just, just. I want just, just. I want to give a comment. Just we want to simplify uh, to the audience uh, what we mean by non-responding diabetic macular edema. Because you know that most of the audience now are not all of them a retina consultant. So just we need to give uh, in this uh, session a guidelines when we consider the diabetic macular edema is a non-responding diabetic macular edema, and uh, when we need to shift or to switch. To another kind of anti-vigif or to the steroid because we need to reach to the general agreement uh, between us thank you very much okay so, thank, thank you very much doctor uh, and there's uh, if there is after 24 weeks if there is uh, no reduction in the baseline oct and the central macular thickness baseline oct if there is no reduction by 10 percent this is not response do you think okay. that the thickness? Do you think that the thickness is the important parameter or the morphology of the edema? Yeah, but yes, it is. The, it is it's very important. Central macular thickness and morphology, and also the visual of the patient. But yeah. for me, yeah. okay. 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 both both work and axis of a protocol. I dependent on the vision of the patient, on visual of the patient, and the both work analysis of a protocol T. Uh, for determining the response and the persistent, current persistent macular edema depend on sickness, on the central macular, central macular sickness. Okay. Please, can we... Any comment from the minutes?
No, I want to go to Dr. Magdi. Dr. Magdi, what's your opinion and the definition? Um, Fawaz raised a very good question. We have to define who is responders and who are not responders. Yes. So, um, I don't know if 24 weeks, which means six months, is a, um, is, is in, is in plan a long time to judge. As Dr. Fawaz said, after three loading goes, you have to look at the OCT, thickness and structure OCT. Because you can get amazed sometimes, the vision will not improve, or the vision is improved, and relatively to the central positive. So, responder or non-responder has to be by central macular thickness. Non-responder, 10% or less, is non-responder. Okay. More than 10%, they are responder. And there is another category, good responder or moderate responder. This has to be put in mind. This is the real life practice. Dr. Magdi, can, can we add a comment, please, Dr. Magdi? If you have, a, 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 a starting with three loading dose and you judge, between the first scan of OCT before the first injection and rely on the third scan of OCT after four weeks of the third injection, and you didn't yes. find any improvement in structural or visual acuity of the patient between the first OCT before the first injection. So I, in my practice, I doing OCT and visual acuity assessment before the first injection and the second injection and the third injection to justify if this a patient is uh, resistant to this type of injection or not because I have a patient that that I am comparing from first scan OCT before the first injection and comparing the second the OCT but after four weeks of the third injection there is no improvement at all but in between you have an improvement in visual acuity and you have improvement in the structure of OCT so I my message is don't do as just two OCT before the first scan the first injection and the third injection. You agree with me or not? Uh, let me tell you something. Hmm. You did uh, OCT at baseline, OCT at one yes. month, OCT at two months, OCT at three months. Yes. Am I right? Yes. You find mild improvement in the second. And right? third, and the first, after first. After the first. Mild improvement in the second. And in the third. We have a, and the, the, we, in the third, OCT. we have the same OCT of the first. So this is non response. Why? You said it's improvement. In, in, in my practice, I've never seen a patient who improved much after first injection, second injection, and then he re, re, recurred after the third injection. They improve mildly, but not that dramatically. If you have improvement from the first and second injection, I don't think the third injection will be the same as the first uh, the third OCT will be the first as the first one. Okay. Unless this patient went into a disaster like hemoglobin A1C shooting, hypertensive retinopathy, renal failure, sometimes they recur very rapidly. But if you are going by the book, one, twice, and three times injection, I don't think we should do. I, I used to do that because I have the OCT and I do it every month. Yeah. But in my, uh, yeah, in my observation, the patient who respond early, they keep responding. They don't respond at all, they don't respond. Okay. Sometimes I found it at the third okay. month, much more than the beginning. Sometimes I find that the thickness is 500, it came to 540 after the third injection. These are definitely a non-responder to this injection. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. 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 Uh, for me, uh, if I have uh, um, persistent diabetic macular edema, uh, I will switch after four injections. Uh, there, uh, there is always room for late response. I have seen those patients a lot in my practice. Uh, and they don't respond at the beginning, and then they respond later on. Especially for those who don't have options to inject steroids. Uh, so my goal for a residence or for uh, a general practitioner uh, ophthalmology that uh, they can start always with Havas, this very cheap uh, um, anti-vigil. They can inject for four injections, then if, if the OCT didn't show uh, or show, uh, didn't uh, resolve the edema or suboptimum uh, uh, results, they can switch to a flip percept. Uh, I just want to add something here. I, I don't know why not all the people in Europe are using Zaltrap. Zaltrap is the same uh, as ILEA, identical, not similar, identical uh, but in different upper solution. 
Uh, it is extremely safe. I've been injecting more than five or six thousand uh, injections by now. I didn't have a single problem. So it is very cheap. It's the same price of uh, Avast, uh, Avastin. Uh, and I uh, do another two injections. If the patient did not respond, then I switch to steroids. Another go, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed, when you presented this case, those type of edemas uh, that shows uh, multi, uh, that cystic pattern with or without separate fluid, they respond very well to steroids. But there is, uh, we have a problem that we don't know if this uh, patient is will respond to anti-vegip or steroids until we try the anti-vegip, we fail, we go to steroids. Uh, because uh, the steroid, when uh, edema responds to steroids, that means the main pathological uh, factor is uh, inflammatory symptoms and uh, not vegip itself. So I usually go with those types of edemas, intra-arterial with uh, supraparoid or triamcinolone, as the first uh, as a first injection, I do it only every two months. As starting injection number zero, within one week to two weeks, I have a resolved edema. It works like magic. But as I mentioned, with uh, cystoid macular edema uh, pattern, those with macular thickening and those without the uh, cystoid macular pattern, uh, they uh, usually uh, do not respond very well to this treatment, and I have to inject them a uh, monthly injection of uh, antibiotic. And uh, I just want to add uh, a, a comment: Why it's 24 weeks? Why they, they, they in the literature it said like that? Because for uh, uh, commercial purposes to uh, promote the uh, intravitreal injections, maybe. But uh, as we all know, that the microaneurysms have uh, life is about uh, six months. So uh, if we do a fluorescent angiography for a patient uh, uh, with diabetic macular edema, we see leaking microaneurysms, and we repeat it within six months. We can see those microaneurysms uh, after, of course, injections. Uh, we see those um, microaneurysms uh, has a reduced in size and in number. So we have to take this into our account. Another thing I want to add, if the patient is complicated with proliferative diabetic retinopathy, then a monthly intravitreal injection is a must, whether I put a teriapsinone in a supraparietal space or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Amin. Uh, can we go to our case, Mohammed? Uh, so we have, the, we all we agree with the, all the Lebanese opinion, uh, the right eye, there's no response. So we need to switch to other option. And the left eye, there is a response. So we continue with the same antivirus. So, Hamid, what's your, uh, tre uh, what are the treatment options for chronic persistent diabetic ocular edema? Do you yes. switch to Renzimab? As you, uh, you start with the Bifazimab, right? Yes, Abbas. We start with Bifazimab, Hamid? Yes, I start with Abbas. So we will switch to the Rantimab or switch to Aflibiarsib or we will, uh, will switch to the intravitreal corticosteroid. What's your, what you do? What you did? Sorry. So thank you for the panelists and all my involved. Actually, yeah. this, I start with Avastin as I show you, okay? And I usually, in my practice, I uh, usually switch after five injections, not three injections, because as uh, Dr. Magdi say and Dr. Amin say, maybe we get uh, um, improvement after the third or fourth injection. So usually in my life, in my practice, I usually shift after or switch after the five injection when I we reach to the criteria of persistent or chronic persistent. Now, we discuss what are the choices that I have. I start with Avastin, should I switch to the this should I switch to ILEA? Should I switch to intravitreal steroid? For me, I'm not, if I start with Avastin, I will not shift with uh, Lucifus. Why? Because both of them are uh, the same uh, antibody, the same structure. So just one is fragmented. In our in our market, we uh, usually start with the, with the cheapest one. Actually, I, I think all of us will start with Avastin uh, because Lucifus is not usually available and it's high expensive. Then. When I take a patient for five or six injection, I decide to switch for a fly percept. A fly percept is a little bit uh, different from uh, the lucentis and the, 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 the avasti because it can uh, have an antibody for AB and placenta dating growth factor, and uh, it's have a molecular weight in between of both of them. So uh, th this is, was one of my choices. The other choice that we have to st give steroid, I know steroid have a very magic result, especially with a persistent or chronic persistent. But so, uh, Mohamed, uh, uh, why you don't use the steroids in this patient? 
the after six injection and there's no response yes you are right Mustafa, because i counsel my patient now we have to put for my patient he's a free kick and if you can monitor he have a little bit high border iop so and i discussed with him he's a free kick and uh, the iob and i told him that the possible risk that he may get cataract or uh, increase in the iop he he told me uh, do we have any other choice i i asked him yes uh, we have an apply person so i decided to take an apply person when I, go back, when I go back to the literature, I see there is now a, a protocol conducted like a protocol AC. They try to uh, explain, it's in phase two uh, clinical trials, they, they try to uh, assess the early switch from Avastin to ILEA. At the same time, we have another study are conducted with my bro, Dr. Ashraf uh, Sharawi, and Dr. Masuka, the retrospective study, they, they assess the early switch after uh, three injection of Avastin to uh, IREA and uh, Lucentis, uh, especially when we get less than 10% thickness. They uh, both in both groups. Okay, they start with three injection of a bastin. Then one group give them ILEA after not getting response. The other group getting lucentis. Both of the group had a short improved vision after the first injection. So I decided to go for a fly bursit. Very nice, Mohammed. So uh, for the right eye, we switch to a fly bursit, and for the left eye, we I continue with the bivalve vim map. Right. Yes. And this is the okay. first injection. This is the baseline when I was reaching the baseline after six months. This is after first month from ILEA, we get a reduction in the centrifugal thickness. And this Very is nice. in the second month. And unfortunately, because the COVID-19, we are in complete lockdown for four months, for four weeks now, I stopped the injection. So I need to hear the opinion of Dr. Magdi. That, uh, did what I do, it's right or no? What's your opinion, Dr. Magdi? Uh, telling you the truth, he did the right thing. He switched it from one anti measure to another. But let's not go to the um, commercial thing. We have both of them available. I mean, according to the availability. But as you said, there is difference between atriprocept and uh, And you said you switch it to atriprocept. You said another study was done switching from one anti measure to another, like from Avastin to Lucentis. And I, I do ship. I do start by Avastin like you. I never start by you know the expensive drugs. We are in a poor country. So we start by Avastin. And uh, I don't uh, disagree with Dr. Amin when he said uh, after three injections, there is no response. Yes, after five injections, you might find a response. And this is a good point because not all the non responder has to switch, but the patient comes to uh, consult with you. Should I keep injecting this? And I always shift. As you said, after five injections, or even sometimes six injections, if the patient can afford earlier, I'll switch it. But you did the right thing. You switched from Avastin to IVEA, and you had a good response, as I see. And I think we should continue that. The question is how long you are going to continue. Because again, we all know that sometimes the patient will never get dry. And I think the new slides will show us different opinion. Thank you. Dr. Mustafa, I can give a comment. Yeah. Yeah, uh, would you please go back to the to the image of the OCT of your case? Okay, Muhammad, go yeah. back. Now, uh, when you look to the OCT, the baseline OCT, usually when I look to the OCT, I can find some predictors of the uh, inflammatory driven macular edema. As you know, that uh, the hyperreflective dots on the OCT, yeah, hyperreflective hyperreflective dots of the OCT. As uh, many mentioned, uh, like Professor Gabriel Koskas and Professor Eduardo Medina, he mentioned that the hyperreflective dots on the OCT are the uh, microglial cells. And the neurosensory detachment that we found in your case, actually, it's a typical finding uh, because of the trapped microglial cells that will attract more and more inflammatory mediators. So that's why when I found such kind of edema, usually I'm thinking that this edema is more inflammatory driven. So in your case, you shift to the aclibercept, which is also a very good option. But for me, in those cases, after many uh, injections and they're showing no response, it's better for to shift them to the steroid arm because they're responding very well. You will spend the time. You will get very good uh, rapid response to them because, you know, long-standing edema, more effect on the vision. Now, regarding yes, the counseling, counseling of your patient, it's a very good idea. 
uh, because we know that the, the side effect of the steroids, like the cataract and the, uh, the glaucoma. Now, uh, I, I, one of the users of the uh, intra steroid implants in many of my cases, actually I didn't face the problem of the glaucoma rather than facing the spikes of the IOP that usually we face it in the uh, first or second month after the injection. And most of the patients, they don't need any treatment. Uh, now, regarding the cataract, the cataract, yes, is an issue, but I think we, the, the chronic persistent diabetic macular edema, it's more dangerous than the matter of the cataract that we can nowadays remove it very easily with a FACO procedure. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I want uh, to know the answer of this question from our panelists. Uh, do you think if we start with a flabier sept, the result will be better? If we start with a flabier sept, Mohammed, I'm a panelist. If we start with a flabier sept, the result will be better from the start of the bevazimab? May I ask a question? How to vote? Where is the button to vote? <laughs> Uh, you, you can't vote. We, can, we, cannot, we cannot vote. As a, yeah. You are a We only can talk. No, in the, <laughs> now you can, only can talk and there is no vote? Can, yeah, no vote yes, for us. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. But just tell me where to vote from. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't want to vote now. But where the button to vote to vote from? <laughs> you are a You can't vote. No, I, I, I know I can't, but where is the button? <laughs> no, there is no button for the panelists. The, the, the other participants can see the button. Yeah, yeah. I see. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank Yes, the results now, the results, they say it's about uh, 54, they say maybe, uh, 47, they say yes, maybe have a good result. Okay, so the opinion of our panelists, do you tell me if we start uh, with, uh, with a fly BR set, if we, can, if we start with a fly BR set, the result will be better from start from the Viva Zimab? Telling you the truth, I don't think so, because we will never know who will work, which drug will work and which drug will, will not work. But in my opinion, giving you a, a little bit of clinical practice uh, guidelines for me, once the patient is chronic, is not presented recent, uh, recently or early, I think we should start with a percent. But if the patient is coming with a cystoid macular edema with a minimal thickness, 350, and he's saying that he's a recent history, I would start with a vascular. But again, okay. a chronicity, different behavior in the disease. Long-standing disease means there is a lot of mediators in there. So we need a stronger thing to start with. This is my opinion. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, sir. Um, Mohammed, was it me? Yes. Uh, what's your opinion? If we start with FLIBR, the result will be better? Actually, we, we, in, this, in this subject, we have uh, no any evidence-based uh, data clear, but in a post-hoc analysis for protocol T, they, they think yes. that in, the, 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 in post-hoc analysis, they, they go back to the data of protocol T, they start to analyze them. They think that in the, in the, in the, in the data, Percept will get improvements and also they will show a better VA improvement and normal anatomical functions. So that's what I find. So I go to Azortex and also I told you I don't go for a steroid because I counsel the patient and the patient refuses that. So um, I think uh, I would like to ask here Dr. Amin. Dr. Amin, do you think if we added Azortex, does that make change? Yes, of course, it will uh, make change. And I think if you started with uh, a few percent from the beginning, it will make changes because uh, the uh, thickness of the MAC lamp, the baseline vision, uh, is all uh, indicative of uh, using uh, a free percept. And another thing, uh, if we use a free percept, we don't need to wait for five or six injections. Four injections, the patient does not respond. There is no uh, meaning of switching back to uh, pipacizumab or ranipizumab. So we can start with those So we shorten the journey for the patient. Okay, so, uh, just one question to, uh, to Dr. I mean, uh, what's the criteria? Yes. 
of CTO and the patient. You can determine. I will start uh, with that. Maybe I'll start all with the other state. According to the central market of sickness, according uh, to... Yeah. Uh, if the patient is uh, 20, uh, 50 and less, it's uh, indicated for uh, using uh, uh, a flipper septa. Uh, sorry, as sorry, I, uh, sorry, if uh, the vision the is, I don't, it's not clear, 20, the vision? 20, 20, 50 and less. Or 20, 50 and less, according to the visual equity. If the visual equity is yes. 20, 50 or less, yes. you start with the FIBR yes. set. Uh, regarding yes. uh, the, the, the central macular thickness. Is there is any criteria for central uh, macular sickness? Uh, yes, uh, uh, as post hoc analysis for protocol yeah. you showed, uh, yeah. on a small group of people, of course, uh, which should be interpreted uh, carefully, if the, uh, there is a 400 uh, micron and more, uh, it, the FP percept will have a better anatomical results in comparison to Pipazizumab. However, this did not show in uh, Renfizumab unless the vision is 20, 50 and less. Okay, thank you very much. So your recommendation, if we have visual acuity, 20, uh, 50 or less, and the central macular thickness, 400 micrometer or more. So we will go or, or, uh, or, 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 no, no, or, or, uh, or the, the, no need, or, to, yes, or, no, no, uh, 20, 50 is the main uh, Right. If we had 400 and more is lesser than uh, it's a list criteria, but it's shown in the post hoc analysis. Mustafa, may I okay, ask you a you question, for, please, Mustafa? You. Yes, yes, of uh, course. Do you rely in your black in about in the number of central foveal sickness exact as uh, every now and then you, you tell us the, the number of central foveal sickness? For me, I don't rely on the number of the central foveal sickness. Yes, I I'm, uh, I'm, uh, agree with you. I always start with the Bivazimab. Always start with Avasti. No, I don't understand Basta my question. Uh, no. yes. Okay, uh, can I ask uh, the panelist a question? Okay, of course. Okay, uh, the, let's to put the question in this matter. When you decide to give the patient the antivigif, and when you decide to give the patient the steroids, when you look to the edema from the first time, for me, from the first time, I didn't use this. Yeah, because, 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 yeah, because sometimes we're facing a very huge edema. Okay, as you may, as you, as you shown in your case, uh, with a new neurosensory detachment, and uh, uh, let's just say uh, more than 500, 700 microns. So, would you prefer some in some cases to use uh, like the steroids as a first line? Okay, for me, for me, as primary treatment, I'm always use antivigif. Good, good answer. Good, good, okay. good and quick answer. We have to be quick. quick. <laughs> yes. We have to be quick. Are, Do I have a yes, comment? Yes. My, my recommendation also, first line is antivigif. This is the gold standard of Hamad. Yes. Yes. If there's yes. a primary diabetic macular edema, if there's a non-response, we think of the switch to steroid. The primary treatment is antivigif. This is my opinion, and, and I, do the, I did that in my practice. Me too. So, but, me too. Uh, me too. Yes, uh, but if you face the patient that is contraindicated to antivigif, like the patient with recent stroke or recent MI, or the patient not afraid from taking multiple injections, and we face many patients like this in the private sector, would you prefer to use the steroid as a first line? Me. Is the, is the, okay. Can you ask? Okay. Yes, yes, you yes. Your reason, yes. Yeah, okay. If there is because a good sin, of course. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Now, well, we always well, should start well, with well, 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 and naive and, yeah. you know, yes. You are yes, twisting sir. the question. You are twisting yeah. the question. We <laughs> no, are, no, I'm not. We, I'm not we, we have audience. We, we have yeah, audience. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, uh, our, our, our gold standard in yeah. practice is yeah. primary line of treatment and treatment. Yeah, sure. Is that right sure. or not? Yes, of course. I, Everybody is agreeing on that. But I, 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 yes, I agree. if you have contraindication, this is for sure you yeah. are pushing us to the answer. But yeah, sometimes yeah. if you have contraindication, you can wait until four or six weeks to pass and start anti Just, just I want to, uh, just by, I want to the way, by the way, yeah. Yeah. we forget, yes, we have a uh, central diabetic macular edema and patient, let's say, we cannot inject him intravitreal anti nor steroids. We can do laser. Yeah. Laser will fixate the uh, uh, the edema till we uh, stabilize the systemic uh, uh, 
problems and we switch back to anti We should not forget that laser is uh, good, uh, is treatment is a treatment and we shouldn't forget about it. I know it's not as the first time as uh, it was, but it's still there. Can I, can I ask a question, Dr. Amin? Yes. Yes. Can I have a comment? Question, direct, direct question. Do you think a patient with a 550 micron with mm -hmm. cystoid macular mm -hmm. edema, non proliferative, mm -hmm. will be beneficial from laser photocoagulation? Mm -hmm. No, yes no? Uh, you will, we will get a step, no, we, but we will get a stabilized edema. We stabilize the edema depending until on we what? Stabilizing uh, fix the edema, systemic depending on what? event. Depending on what? If it's uh, not vision. ischemic even. If it's not vision. ischemic, there's no ischemia in the macula, there's no ischemia in the periphery. Yeah. On what basis you would do this the photocoagulation? Yeah. Hey, so uh, again, because we are uh, <laughs> running... I'm this. talking, if, uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 Okay, okay, sorry, but just um, uh, if I cannot inject anything. Don't do anything. If you cannot inject, you shouldn't do what anything. What shall I do? You should wait. Control. Uh, yes, we can, control by we, can we can stabilize. <laughs> هل لو كانت هذه if we start this case from the beginning on aflibercept and the patient showing no response, what's the option? What's the option, next option for you? Would you switch to another kind of anti-vigif or you switch to the other arm of treatment like steroids? Um, can I have the comment, please? Yeah. Can I comment? Ah, uh, yes, yes, please. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, at the beginning, you, you had very nice uh, comment about the including the steroid at the beginning of the treatment, it yeah. will uh, have better good visual acuity. Uh, yeah. acuity. Uh, to make it simple, the uh, the main problem with adaptive microedema is the VEGF, right? Yeah. So we are yes. right. the, the, the big arm of the uh, of the problem is the bioactive VEGF. However, this is not the only. Always with the diabetic mind, there is some kind of inflammatory process. So if we include the steroid. From the beginning, with the anti VEGF, we will have a better outcome. Wait, we will, uh, uh, including steroid, not necessarily intravitreal. We can do it saptinone. This will reduce the side effects, the glaucoma and cataract. This is number two. This is as simple as that. Number, uh, num uh, this is number one, sorry. Number two, we have to ask our question, uh, ourselves one question why this patient is not responding or is poorly responding. Switching just anti-VEGF, it might be it's not solve the, the problem. Are we guarantee if we switch into anti-VEGF, it will get a better outcome? I think if the patients have poor response, this is the time for fluorescein to roll out ischemia and that there is ischemia, I think, no sense to switch to any kind of anti-VEGF. Thank okay, you. but if you start if you start from the beginning on the highest end anti vegf like the flibercept, and All the right. patient showing no response, so uh, is there any uh, issue to switch to another kind of anti vegf since the flibercept is not uh, not achieving the goal? We said you said there is no any response or poor response. No, but no. The, the, let's just say there is a poor response. Okay, uh, to a flibercept. Uh, after after the three loading doses, okay, your patient's not getting very uh, more than five letters, and the morphology of the edema not changed. Is there any sense to change to another kind of antivirus, like turning back to rambizumab or uh, avastin, or you should shift to another arm of treatment like the steroid? Before because doing reactions, let me do a fluorescein FFA. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I totally agree with you that we need to do the fluorescein and the assessing the risk factor. But let's just say that you did the fluorescein, no peripheral ischemia, everything is okay, and you assess the patient that there is no ischemic element. But my question, uh, when you use the highest end of, uh, of anti vegf according to the protocol team, the aflibercept is the best one, but uh, there is no or the poor response. Uh, would you prefer to shift to another kind of, uh, of, uh, of arm, like steroids or... Shall we, yes, shall we shift yes. to the next question? Shall we shift to the next question, please? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. Okay. <laughs> this is the okay, okay. 
this debate, this debate will never end because yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. No, no, because now, now is the time to shift. Now is the last word. I mean, huh? each case should be individualized. And yes, if yes, no one yes, from yes, us yes. is wrong yes, in, in his management, but yes. he's think that this this way is the correct one. But yes. I think all the all the options can produce some kind of improvement, maybe to the highest or to the medium. But yes. I think each case should be individualized. Uh, yes, I totally agree. Yes. My last question now: What is the role of parsiplanar vitrectomy in refractory diabetic myocarditis? Doctor Mohammed Taufi Hamada. Hey, Abish. Hamada. Hey, Abish. Hamada, hello. Uh, I think if you think for BBV uh, and uh, diabetic macular edema, you think earlier. If you think late, you will get a structural improvement with no functional improvement. Okay. So uh, I, uh, you are, you, you can hear me. Yes. Yes, with you, Ahmed. Finally, when I go back searching to this, uh, I, I, I show this diagram. He say we have to depend on many factors. We have to go for the uh, fluorescein and geographic detect if there is a leakage, we give laser. If we have an ibrotical membrane, we go for a vitrectomy. Then we have to conclude whether the patient is a faking, not faking, to add a fly percept or change to dexamethasone. As, as the Tofari say, each case will be individualized. Them. And uh, finally, we uh, at least we get a define or definition for what is the meaning of persistent diabetic macroedema and what is the meaning of chronic persistent diabetic macroedema. How to deal with them, whether switching to each other, even if we debate. But this debate is actually in every conference we go the same debate until now we don't get because there is no clear guidelines, Mohammed. There is yes. no clear guidelines for the switch for switching to the other antivirus. Doctor Majdi Musa, the last word for you. What's your opinion? Lastly, my my, my opinion. That let's let's be uh, honest with each other. We all try all antivirus. We all try steroids. We all use whatever we have in hands to compete with diabetic macroedema. But let's go back with the, our guidelines, clinical guidelines. We start always with antivirus. There is no doubt about it. Sometimes we can start with the, the cheapest because we are in a country like your country. We have to start by Avastin. I always start by Avastin up till now, but if you have the option to start by a strong anti like a few percent, you start with it. We all know that another anti is coming to the market in six months and it will stay longer. But uh, again, anti is the first line of treatment. And I agree completely with uh, Dr. I think um, Mustafa said or Mohammed with the posterior subtenant, sometimes it works magically with resistant cases, posterior subtenant was intravitreal intervention. I like that very much, and I use that very much. Uh, and I use the cheap thing, which is a primacy one, of course. And then we can switch to, if we start with Avastin, switch to uh, a few percent or run or run with that. And I always switch. And after switching, if there is no response, you, uh, three injections, you have to uh, deal with uh, steroids. Steroids as a primary line of treatment, sometimes in fake, in pseudo fake, I'm sorry. And in non steroid responder, and I used to, to do drops for one week and I see if the patient is responder or not. And second line also, there, it is a very good response to steroids once the anti doesn't work. And we have to, as we said, tailor our treatment according to the patient. But the most important thing is controlling the systemic uh, uh, diabetes, controlling very important. Second thing we have to know how the patient can afford continuing or not, because we lose a lot of patients because we cannot continue. But starting with a cheap one, shifting the expensive one, if you are, if you can afford, and then with steroids. And I think parsiplanar vitrectomy has a role, but it's a very, very limited role because, as Dr. Mohammed said, you always think late of surgery. You always think late because you, uh, uh, I mean, running out of the options, and then you go to surgery. No way that you will get a visual gain. But if you start early, especially if you have a membrane, if you have contraindication, that will be a very good result. And thank you for the invitation, but this is my opinion, and I hope we, uh, we have benefit for the audience because it's, it's nice to brainstorm with each other, but we have to have the guidelines at the end. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. One minute question. Yes, Dr. Philippe. Okay. Um, just I want to ask my colleague, Anyone has an experience with vitrectomy for diabetic macular edema? Primary vitrectomy? 
Yes. Without uh, traction or membrane? Yeah. What would you do? Hamada, did you do anything like this? <laughs> did you do anything like patient coming out of the blue sky with cystoid edema, never be injected, naive patient, and you tell him go to surgery? No. You ever done that? No, never. 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 No one. Never. Okay. Because if you go oh, to the... However, there is a study. There, there is a study conducted for those Yes, this is a study. I think, I, I, I know there is a study. Tell us about the primary yes. vitrectomy in diabetic macular edema. But we are in a practice. <laughs> yes, yes. We tell this about... The, yeah. the, study is, is the, stu the study concluded that the uh, uh, primary vitrectomy is more cost-effective than yes. injection uh, as the... Uh, the cost of injections in U.S. The study was done in the U.S. It would be um, within one year more than the vitrectomy itself. So it's they compare it as a more cost effective. That's all what you said. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all my both and uh, panelists. It was a very fruitful discussion, and I'm very sorry because if we take so much time, we are now four hour and thirty minutes sitting on the. <laughs> Yes. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you, Mohammed, for your effort, for organization. Uh, thank you for thank our panelists, uh, for uh, our blog, Dr. Meiji uh, Moussa, for Dr. Farid Ward, for Dr. Fawaz, for uh, Dr. Mohammed Ahmed Taufiq, for thank Dr. You. I mean, I mean Marashi. Okay, thank you all thank for you. your <laughs> nice discussion. Dr. Mustafa, I would like to remember you. We have a third, inshallah, third meeting. Inshallah. 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 Thanks to, to Dr. Wael Al Jindi for his for his uh, efforts. He have a daily conference, the daily meeting uh, with Dr. Wael. Dr. Wael, thank you very much for your support every way. Shukran, Dr. Wael. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Wael. Dr. Muhammad Ahmed Tawfi, Hamad Shukran. I wish you all the best. Inshallah. Shukran. 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 Shukran.